All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to day two. Um, so we're going to spend a little bit of time first thing. Uh, first of all, going over what the goals are for this day and also summarizing the outcomes of the breakout sessions from yesterday. Um, so up here on the screen, you see the goals for today. And so this is about technological limitations and opportunities. So four goals are listed here. We want to identify priorities for data rescue and reprocessing. Identi identify how data availability maps onto different modes for reanalyses, for example, modern era versus early satellite era versus in situ um, data. We want to identify candidate data assimilation configurations and production strategies to enable scientific objectives of consistent reanalyses in the next decade, and then try to estimate computational costs of reanalysis development and production uh, moving forward. So. Um, we'll again be having breakout sessions and things to try and achieve these goals. So if we could, uh, is, I don't know if this, um, Jenny, can we go to this? Sorry. Uh, oh, it was, it was to get to the summaries from yesterday. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. So there's a lot of text on here. So, uh, me and Patrick are just going to. Um, go through the different questions that we had yesterday and kind of summarize the main answers. And this one had uh, more answers than um, the other questions. So, um, okay, so this was, uh, what do you see as the main user requirements within your field for a consistent and integrated earth system reanalysis? And so as with many things, there are tensions between different user groups. One thing would not satisfy everyone, probably, and so, um, yeah, there's there's that issue. Different people want different things. Uh, on the climate side, people really want to be able to look at trends, and so this requires consistency in time and trying to minimize the artifacts that we have due to observing system changes. Also, we want to kind of gain a process level understanding of of how these trends have come about. So. We want to be able to have some consistency there and kind of all of the other variables that connect to that trend. So if you if you just get a trend in a reanalysis product because you've constrained it by one particular observation, that doesn't necessarily help you to get at the processes if it's all coming in from the analysis increments. Um, and so, okay, so that's the first two. Then there is um, a need for a consistent approach across the different systems and centers for characterizing the budgets. Um, and I think this could be challenging just because of the different ways that the reanalyses are produced. For example, MERA has the incremental analysis update, so you can easily close the budget, but that's not really true for some other reanalysis products. Um, an important point is that there should be some more consistent quality across space. So obviously there's higher quality in regions where um, some of these reanalyses are being produced. For example, Europe probably has higher quality reanalysis than, than Africa. And so uh, an effort should be made to try and improve that. Um, there was some talk of maybe we need to just have different kinds of products so because not one product will please everyone so products that are for climate monitoring that would be more consistent in time versus products that just put all of the observations they can in that might be more desirable for things like initialization or for shorter time scale studies um there was a need for improved consistency in the data formats um and another important point was getting a consistent set of metrics to track things as as the the products evolve in time, but also a, for kind of intercomparing between different reanalysis products. There, I think there's been some effort, for example, the the SRIP Spark reanalysis intercomparison project, but probably we should be doing more of those kinds of studies. Um, and then, okay, uncertainties, I think, yeah, budgets, I guess, have, have come up again there in the second to last point. And also uh, improved consistency in wh what the different components of the reanalyses are seeing. Like, so, for, for example, yesterday we heard about the biogeochemistry work and, the, and then the, the aerosol work. And so at this point, there's a 
probably some disconnect between, for example, what the radiation scheme is seeing versus what the, the biogeochemistry is producing. So trying to get all those things to be more consistent across all of the different components um, is important. Okay. Um, can you go to the next slide? Okay. Uh, so this is the, the question about the emerging applications. Um, so the carbon cycle is, is an up and coming thing. And um, it was in our group, at least it was considered that probably to have all of the ocean and land and atmosphere coupled together from a carbon cycle perspective was probably more than a 10 year time frame, just because of the challenges that are faced in the land component in particular. But there are kind of intermediate goals that we could get to before that. Um, more coupled reanalyses with the dynamic ocean and more ocean biogeochemistry. Also more high frequency and finer spatial scale output that could help to deal with some of the mismatch between looking at kind of, yeah, local, local regions and then kind of coarser resolution reanalyses that we currently do. Um, there's a desire for more trustworthy representation of precipitation. So that could, that's, that would be useful for in terms of land atmosphere interactions and also getting kind of process level understanding of things like the MJO, if you want to look at the circulation and the precipitation in a way that's all consistent. Um, there should be enhanced use of analysis increments to try and understand underlying model issues. And then uh, this came up yesterday in Anne's talk in particular that there could be an enhanced feedback to observing system requirements where we can show really where we're missing things um, that would be helpful for the reanalysis. Uh, next slide. Or can I do that here? Okay. okay. <clears throat> yeah, so the, um, the next question that was uh, discussed was what are some opportunities unmet needs in the private sector regarding reanalysis and what are the opportunities for private sector public partnerships? And so there's a list of, you know, things that we, were identified in different breakout groups. First one is the use of the reanalysis data in conjunction with health data. Um, example, so interaction with the public health community. And there, what was that one thing that was identified is that the data, the structures and formats actually in the health community is actually potentially could be improved in order to be much more readily accessible and have the right metadata standards to actually be used in conjunction with the reanalysis. An example of Analysis that could be done in conjunction with, re, um, yeah, with the reanalysis products as the spread of flu, vector-borne diseases, uh, pollution exposure, um, both you know short-term large exposures, but also long-term um, sm small level but consist you know continuous exposure. So there's a lot of opportunities that that, um, that one could. Um, could expand here. Um, then the the very general we had uh, had an example on the wind energy, but also the in much more broadly the expanded use of the reanalysis in guiding the energy transition to renewables, and that it should be uh, much yeah could be a really broad um, topic. Uh, the use of uh, reanalysis data as training data sets for machine learning applications that it's becomes very popular in the private sector, but I think there's also recognition of um, there's not much uh, recognition of the value of the reanalysis products in order as very large data sets to actually produce such, uh, such training capabilities. And so there could be opportunities for joint partnerships that um, also bring in some of the domain expertise of what these products actually can and maybe cannot be uh, used for. Um, in the context of uh, coastal planning, the question about you know uh, regional sea level change, uh, coastal flooding, with regards to large scale coupled atmosphere ocean circulation changes and get sort of a better understanding to coastal planners of, uh, planners of um, what the climatological and uh, context are, what interannual variability is, and, and again, the use of the, the reanalysis products for that. Again, very broadly, in the context of ocean, both the coupled ocean um, uh, marine uh, biology context, of course, the re use of the reanalysis products in the, for the uh, guiding the new blue economy. And on land, similarly, you know, agriculture planning could be a big potential. 
Um, then, in, very broadly, uh, for our community, is really improved training of users. So, um, better documentation of the products and training sessions. Again, with the question of you know what reanalysis products can uh, potentially give you, and also where there are limitations. Um, improved documentation came up for cloud providers. There was an example given that uh, one product being or two products being just basically put up in the cloud and um, and not with really poor documentation and also provenance um, to you know where this actually comes from and what it actually means. And then uh, very specifically, I, mean, I think we might probably touch upon this also today on software workflows connecting to to this with um, with efforts less, such as Pangeo where a lot of workflows are being developed in to really uh, much more advance the, the data source. So next slide, please. Do you want to take that one? Okay. Yeah. yeah, I thought we added another one. Okay, so this one was not discussed so extensively in the groups. I guess we have one point here. Um, there's this signal to noise paradox in kind of shorter, uh, well, seasonal to decadal predictions, particularly in the UK Met Office model, but it's been seen in a variety of contexts, which is pretty concerning, I think, for our ability to be predicting the future. And so maybe reanalyses can help us in that. If we dug a little more into the analysis increments, it could maybe help us to understand the origins of the failures in our, our models and capturing predictable signals correctly. Uh, next slide. Okay. Yeah, I think I think we we had we had added one more thing on the previous slide, and that was sort of the idea of seamless prediction. That means using prediction systems that are used in NWP and really pushing those into the subseasonal to seasonal forecasting realm, into potentially also uh, interannual, where you basically begin to basically merge the timescales, right? So with the NWP, where reanalysis products are typically produced for. Uh, there's a big time scale separation with the climate modeling community that look for you know stable decadal or multi-decadal um, simulations and really how bridge this gap actually could be you know one approach to you know seamless prediction so models that are um, you know well suited for one time scale you know how how do they uh, work on other time scales and to the extent that they don't work well you know what are the the fundamental um, mechanistic origins of that so that was still for the previous slide but now uh, I think it's a uh, final, maybe, um, which is how can we foster collaboration between the climate modeling and the reanalysis production communities? Um, so clearly, um, the, there's enhanced collaboration between those communities are, are needed. And um, we think that both of community would uh, gain from, on the one hand side, the process representation capabilities in Earth system models. Uh, that's how um, one of the, the the NWP or the reanalysis community could gain experience. And then in turn, the earth system modeling community or the climate modeling community would gain from understanding of the underlying model issues that are revealed in, in the day-to-day -day operational settings, for example, in understanding and better evaluating um, analysis increments. Um, the enhanced use of assimilation frameworks for uh, diagnosing model errors, it's a related topic, um, and enhanced um, extending the notion of data assimilation to support uh, comprehensive and data-informed climate model calibration. So that basically here, this is moves towards sort of a gray matter optimization by sort of individual who knows the model well, more towards formal frameworks for parameter estimation. Um, and then, Climate modeling community uh, arguably might um, be able to benefit from expertise of the analysis community to confront the model with the diverse and heterogeneous data streams. Um, the characterization of the uncertainty in the reanalysis versus in the climate models and there the question about whether in both climate models and in the reanalysis there is um, the, the same multivariate response relationship um, in, in these models, right, for anomaly, you know, the, what are the, the, the origins of those anomalies and do they, the, the, the causal uh, patterns basically agree between reanalysis products and, and climate models. And yeah, actually, the last one is the one that I just mentioned on um, on the the time scale gap with uh, with the idea of uh, seamless prediction. So a lot of recurring topics that could probably be more uh, succinctly summarized. Um, but um, yeah, I think this is the last of the questions. Or there was one more. Okay. Um,
know. No. Okay. I guess there are some things we maybe added last minute. I think we we had some examples of successful collaborations between reanalyses and climate modeling communities like DART within CSM, and then also the uh, Copernicus initiative, how they've been successful in linking a bunch of communities. Um, I guess, uh, yeah, those probably were added in to last minute to make it onto the slides. So we have time for discussion and questions. Yeah, yeah, I think we have 50 minutes for, for discussion. But it's on. Yeah. Is this on? Yeah. So Ron Gilaro from NASA. So um, can you go back to the first one? So this was a nice set and make a slight criticism here, but it's on me as much as anybody else because we were charged with doing this. So the title here is the requirements for consistent integrated earth system reanalysis. And these are all good bullets, but if that title said requirements within your field for a, an atmospheric reanalysis or for just an ocean reanalysis, all these bullets would be relevant. So I guess my question is, is there anything you think is there anything we've missed here? Well, probably there is, but I'm saying just in general, that pushes these things more about the challenges of an integrated earth system reanalysis, as opposed to just stuff that you need to do for all the reanalyses you've already been doing up to this point, that even if we wanted to do the next mirror, that was only an atmospheric analysis, I'd want to make sure we did all this. Yeah. So is there something about, you know, is there another tier of things for an integrated you know, an earth system reanalysis that we haven't touched on. It's just sort of a question I'm throwing out there. Yeah, I think we probably should have more. I guess there's what the last point is probably the only one that is yeah, really exactly. in, in that exactly. realm. And I think, yeah, we realized in our group that we hadn't really talked enough about that when we were going through the this. Re uh, reanalysis set of bullets, not necessarily. So that's something I think we should maybe think about before we finalize and put this all together. Maybe, maybe Ted. I mean, I think in one of the further slides on the user, the applications, I think that's where it becomes clear. For example, the exactly the CO2 is mentioned here, right? And so in the, one of the consecutive slides, you know, the use, for example, of the consistent earth system reanalysis for this the global stock take, right? So where you really need to close, you try to close carbon budgets across all of the different components as one example, or the sea level one, right? So where you actually begin to have to have the, the water budgets between the atmospheric, so the, the, the fresh water fluxes from the atmosphere to the ocean, the, the ocean changes melting from the ice sphere, so you have to bring in the cryosphere. So it really shines in through all of these applications where increasingly we, need, we are recognizing that we, can, we need to close the, the budget ac across the different components, or we, take to, we, we basically account for all the different budgets and see if they close or to what extent they don't actually, and, and to understand the, the coupled system better. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sergey Frolov, I, I totally agree with your own. I think that, you know, when ocean atmosphere, we think about it as balanced analysis. So we don't see any initialization shocks. Um, one thing that I wanted to ask the audience, it, it, it felt like we were pretty defeatist saying that you either have to have a consistent climate reanalysis or you have something that uses all the data and it's only good for NWP purposes. I really hope that's not where we are in 10 years. Like, I feel like we should do better. And, you know, the progress with MERA and ERA 5 shows that, you know, the, the gap is closing. So maybe people want to comment if that's an achievable goal that we no longer, or do we think that we just will always have to have two types of analysis? Someone? If Bill online that has a hands up, maybe related to this. 
Uh, it's it's an interesting point to raise. I don't think we'll get time to resolve it in the next few minutes, but I think that question really hinges on being more intelligent about understanding uncertainties uh, and moving the debate away from a requirement for continuity when you've got discontinuous uncertainties. I think if you have discontinuous uncertainties, as we inevitably have because the observing system is changing, you would expect discontinuities that are really a reflection of your fundamental um, limitation in, in estimating the state. So I, I don't see that discussion as being um, you know, two rival paradigms, I think. I think we have to move to a situation of understanding the full uncertainty budget better and what that means for um, how we detect trends in reanalysis. As I say, I, I think this is a pretty fundamental issue and we probably don't have time in the next nine minutes to, to cover it. So, I mean, that's the ultimate goal, but you need, in the interim, we need to be pragmatic. And if there you speak are, up, we can't hear you. Are going on. I tilt it. Uh, Sarun Kumar from Climate Prediction Center. So I agree with you. I mean, that's the ultimate goal to have a single reanalysis serves all the communities. In the interim, your methodologies and technologies are not at the place. So you have to do something. I just can't sit back. So you probably have to move on with whatever we can at this point. At the same same time, I have some research effort or something to do the right kind of bias corrections with the goal that in the end we could have. Single reanalysis, which could take into account data discontinuities and act on the reanalysis. Try to work towards that. It's just a matter of what we do in between. We had a discussion about some hierarchy of re reanalysis that could work out. So you just use the same framework for the reanalysis, but to have a one with our satellite, they use the same framework to have one with satellite and just build up a hierarchy of these things in the center, which is doing the reanalysis should be able to implement it. as you make it uh, simpler, it is faster to run. I mean, this is just a pragmatic approach in, in, in the interim, but the goal is what you said should be. Lars Lewinsky, no, just to add on to that, because we talked a lot about this in a, the um, uh, virtual breakout yesterday, uh, and a lot of people argued that really maybe just one reanalysis to rule them all isn't the, shouldn't be the goal. Um, I think it's, you know, maybe it's 10 years down the road, but I think users want such different things um, that to try to have one single reanalysis means that everybody will lose as opposed to everybody winning. Um, you know, certain users want certain things. Uh, and so there's maybe an argument to reduce the huge number of reanalyses across different centers. Um, but I don't think we're at the point where we should be arguing um, to reduce, like what Arun was saying, um, maybe the different hierarchies um, of reanalyses, because then Everything <laughs> I, I would think that all of the users would then be disappointed, right? They would all um, lose something um, with maybe no gain except for fewer data sets. Um, so I, I would think maybe maybe 20, 30 years when we can run high resolution closed budgets for 100 year reanalyses, then maybe we can talk. But for now, I don't know that that's a reasonable goal. So it's Cecile. Cecile, did you have a question? Or yeah, it's a comment, but um, it's on the Ron's comment. So if there's someone in the room that wants to keep uh, that discussion about one versus several reanalyses, we can finish that off first. I, oh, yeah, Ron. I, yeah, just to that point, I, I just think it's going to come down to a practical issue because I think you're right. But well. Addressing Sergey's point first, I think hopefully over the next five to ten years, you know, we are getting better at consistency. Um, I was saying yesterday, in the end, agencies are going to make choices because of their mission. You know, at NASA, there's an inch high 
brought up MLS yesterday. You know, if a, a mission like that's there, where we're not going to be able to ignore it, even though we know it's going to introduce a discontinuity and there's no follow on for it, right? And so we know that's going to be an issue. But there's no way we could have left it out. But as far as, you know, the cost of running one that's you know, a hierarchy or something, I think that's a great idea. But, you know, particularly, particularly as we start to bring in more components, the cost isn't going to be driven by the observations. It's going to be driven by, especially if you're doing 4D stuff, and it's going to be the cost of the algorithm. So it's not going to be that much cheaper to run with pulling out a you know, a few observations or not assimilating these data sets or whatever. So I just think it's going to be a, you know, it's just going to be a practical issue. I just, you know, I know what it's like to just get one of these things produced. You know, it's years. But. Any further points on this topic? Okay, Cecile, I think you can go ahead. Um, so I wanted to go back to the point that Ron made about the fact that this, uh, what's on the slide right now is really, uh, for individual system and doesn't actually mean anything for an integrated earth system. Realized. I think that that's actually, um, I don't completely agree because the reality is that, for example, consistent consistency of data format, when you think about it. If everyone is consistent in terms of the data format, but also the temporal resolution, the time coverage, that that is the first step towards an integrated Earth system. Realize is you need to have things that are compared, like that can be easily used, whether that's you know on an offline basis or in a fully coupled model. But um, having was consistency between approach. Uh, on, on you know several of these points, I think will help you go towards the integrated system. So um, that was my two cents. Okay. Yeah, I think Ron agrees. <laughs> I didn't want. <laughs> Any other comments? And I guess we'll just start the next session, which I think Laura is chairing, or you or you're giving a thank you, Patrick and Isla, for a great summary. And I think that uh, the next talk will be a perfect um, follow up. Um, it was originally planned to be presented by Gil Compo. Uh, Gil is not able to be here. He caught some uh, nasty bug and Laura on a very short notice, put together slides to start discussing this idea of hierarchy of different reanalysis, what that might look like. And the rest of the session, Laura will also be uh, moderating the speakers and the discussion. All right, um, thanks. Yeah, so I apologize in advance that this will be very rough because I kind of put this together very last minute. Um, but I do think this is a really important um, topic that we need to discuss uh, at this workshop. And so um, I just wanted to to make sure that it was out there. Um, and as organizing committee prerogative, I will not be answering the questions that we posed to all the speakers and instead I'll be asking uh, more questions of the audience. Um, perfect, okay. So the um, idea was to talk about different periods for reanalysis um, and I am going to try to make a case or at least ask if we should make a case um, for this hierarchy of reanalyses. Uh, before, but before I get into that, um, I kind of wanted to go over the stuff that I'm familiar with. So I work on sparse input historical reanalyses. Um, in, in, in particular, I work on the 20th century reanalysis. And I think, I hope a lot of you are familiar with this, but for those uh, in the audience who aren't, I just wanted to introduce it. Um, so it provides a global 200 year history of sub daily weather, and it does this by assimilating only surface pressure observations. So we've talked a lot about consistency in time and one of the ways that we can go back further in time uh, with, you know, avoiding the as many 
artifacts due to changes in the observing system as possible is to reduce the observing system down for the entire thing. Um, and so we have reduced it down almost as far as you can get uh, and just using to just use surface pressure, assimilate surface pressure observations. Um, I'll also say that this is an atmospheric reanalysis. And so a lot of what I say will kind of be on the atmospheric reanalysis um, point of view, uh, but I really do want to think more about the um, integrating different components of the Earth, Earth system as well. Um, so version three of the 20th century reanalysis uses an ensemble Kalman filter with 80 ensemble members to quantify uncertainty. Um, Jeff Whitaker is going to talk more about uncertainty and reanalyses later, so I won't talk about that too much. Um, as I said, this is an atmospheric reanalysis, so we prescribe sea surface temperature. Uh, we call this quasi-weekly coupled because we've gone back and forth with the SST providers. So they actually assimilated previous versions of our data set uh, into their ocean reanalysis and gave it back to us. So we have a little bit of a very long time scale coupling. Because we're an atmospheric reanalysis, we estimate all the atmospheric variables you would expect, temperature, wind, precipitation, um, and we actually include some land variables as well. We're on the 75 kilometer grid uh, and we provide our data every three hours from 1836 to 2015, experimentally back to 1806. And ideally we would keep this up to date in real time or near real time. Um, a big challenge with that is the sea surface temperatures. So finding a data set that can span back in time uh, and then is also kept up to date is very difficult. And that's a challenge for uh, these historical reanalyses. Um, and maybe an argument towards moving towards an ocean atmosphere coupled reanalysis. So I have shown this slide um, in other talks to motivate reanalyses. Obviously, I don't need to motivate the need for reanalysis to this group, um, but I wanted to include it just um, to provide a little bit of a bigger picture. Um, so this shows uh, five year average global two meter air temperature anomalies uh, from paleo reconstructions. And that's in the brown that goes back um, about a thousand years here. And this includes the last millennium reanalysis. And I also have climate model projections in red and orange going into the future. And that's from CMIP5. And then we have the instrument based reanalyses uh, that link the two. And we include uh, ERA5, ERA interim, and JRA55 in blue, but those actually don't span far enough backwards um, to really link the paleo and the climate model projections. So the 20th century reanalysis uh, is the only one that's really able to do that uh, now. So I wanted to point that out as a benefit of historical reanalyses. They provide the link between the paleo and the climate model projections. Um, but 20CR in particular is also special because, because it only assimilates surface pressure. It's completely independent from any land surface temperature observations. So it's independent of satellite observations over land or any thermometer based observations. And so it can and has been used as um, essentially independent confirmation of global warming, independent of satellite and thermometer um, overland. The ocean starts to get a little bit more uh, tricky to be able to say that. Uh, and I, again, I just wanted to throw this up to say, you know, a lot of us are familiar with the, uh, a lot of this group is familiar with the full input reanalyses like ERA-5 and what they can be used for. Um, and I kind of wanted to motivate what the historical and centennial reanalyses can be used for. And in particular in green, I've highlighted the ones that sort of the general public and maybe um, these private companies would care the most about. We've talked a lot about renewable energy planning um, and we've mentioned a little bit about insurance and reinsurance. Um, and what I heard a lot yesterday was people asking for longer time series. And so that kind of made me feel better coming from the point of view of making these longer time series. Um, and uh, I think is justification for not, you know, letting these centennial length reanalyses fall by the wayside. So to get to, oops, next. Can I go to the next slide? I don't know why it suddenly won't. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. <laughs> um, so to get to what I was, uh, what we initially wanted this discussion to be uh, is an overview of different periods of reanalysis. Um, and I wanted to start talking about 20CR just to put it out there that there's more than just the full input. Um, but the four broad um, categories of periods of reanalysis uh, that 
I think of as up here. So we have the full input and I know there's lots of different subcategories. I'm really thinking about time period and not, you know, regional versus global, you know, different system components. I want to think about time. So full input is um, the ones that we're familiar with and then uh, conventional only and upper air I'm not as familiar with, but I think there's a, uh, an important space to discuss that sparse input like 20 CR and then paleo also I'm not very familiar with, but I know we have um, at least one person in the audience who I think is so. Um, full input generally can only go back to 1979. I know there's been effort to push back further than that, um, but really, as we heard yesterday, even the the modern ish satellite era begins in 1979. So the further back you go, the more you're going to have to deal with uh, artifacts due to observing system changes. Now, because those reanalyses are generally, you know, this this time period of 40 years is relatively short, we can run at higher, higher spatial and temporal resolutions. Um, they're also going to be the most accurate of all the ones I've listed here because they can use satellite data. Um, and Arrow 5, of course, is the example that we all know. But again, as we mentioned, as I heard a lot yesterday, people want longer time series. And so to go back further in time without, you know, avoiding these artifacts due to big changes, for example, by adding in satellites, well, what you can do is just remove the satellites. Um, and if you're assimilating upper air observations, for instance, again, I'm coming from kind of an atmospheric background, uh, we should be able to go back to about the mid 20th century. Um, a discussion with Stefan Braunemann yesterday, he suggested that with upper air data, we could go back reasonably to 1939, um, potentially earlier if we're willing to, you know, sacrifice our confidence in the estimates. Um, we would then avoid the observing system, as many observing system changes as possible by not assimilating satellite data at all. Uh, and I think this could be really useful, and I know coming from the sparse input side, it is useful um, to illuminate artifacts in the full input reanalyses due to observing system changes. So like we've heard, you know, it might be really obvious if you have a satellite come online and you see your signal jump, but if you see a trend, how do you know if that trend is real? And if you have another data set that doesn't assimilate um, maybe some satellite that you're a little bit worried about and you do see the same trend or you don't see the trend, then that could give you some evidence about whether that trend is real or due to uh, your observations or your model, your observations really. And then sparse input is what I'm the most familiar with. Uh, 20th century reanalysis is an example of these. Um, they span 100 to 200 years back in time. Again, they're harder to keep up to date. The full input reanalyses I'm thinking of are often kept up to near real time. Um, and the sparse input, it's difficult. Um, these, when I think of sparse input, only assimilate surface observations. So surface pressure, uh, maybe surface marine winds. And um, so one of the downsides, of course, besides losing accuracy, because you're not assimilating as many observations as possible, uh, you are also going to have to lose some, generally lose some spatial resolution because you're running a lot more than 40 years, it's going to be a lot more expensive to run 200 years and so you have to degrade your resolution a little bit. And then even further, you could run paleo reanalyses. These extend a thousand years or more back. To the best of my knowledge, uh, the ones out there generally use proxy data, so ice cores, tree rings, et cetera, instead of instrument-based observations. And these are generally very coarse, from my point of view, very coarse resolution, like uh, monthly. Um, but I think there is a place for all of these um, different periods of reanalysis, and I think there's uses for all of them. Um, and I, I wonder if there's a case that can be made for a suite of reanalyses that use the same system um, that essentially sequentially degrade the observing system. And I know we have a lot of reanalyses that fall into these different categories already, uh, but I would argue that the benefits of using the same system is that we can illuminate observation biases by removing those observations and seeing what happens in the system. Uh, and we can illuminate model errors. So if we are assimilating um, fewer and fewer observations, then the, uh, the system isn't pulled as strongly towards the really good observations we have, and we maybe see how the model um, and how the system reacts to only having a few observations constraining it. Four minutes. Thanks. I would also argue 
um, that the sparse input system at least can be used as a test bed for new data assimilation methods, um, both operationally as well as potentially for future um, full input reanalyses. On the other hand, the optimal data assimilation configuration almost definitely will depend on your observing network. So while you might be able to use the same model for each of these different reanalyses, it's likely not going to work if you try to use exactly the same data assimilation system um, with the same uh, tuning parameters and everything. So there's a balance between how, how this could work. And then finally, I'm not as familiar with paleo reanalyses, but I wonder how they could be incorporated. And um, I think this is worth discussing or at least thinking about. Uh, and something we've been discussing on and off has been whether it's possible to blend paleo and sparse input, for example, to extend those sparse input reanalyses further back in time. So eventually you run out of instrument based observations and you really just have a model run like we've talked about uh, yesterday. But if we can also use proxy data to try to constrain that system more, um, yeah, is, is that possible? And so I think this is the last, yep. Uh, so yeah, I'll just uh, leave it here with some questions to the audience. I'm happy to take questions or take answers if you have any, thanks. And technically I'm moderating this session so I can just call on people, I guess. There are a few questions online already. Uh, let's start with Hans. Hi, Laura. Thanks. Thank you for this very nice uh, presentation. I think when you look at the the uh, the case for made a suite of reanalysis, I mean, the most extreme case would be that you have your reanalysis, and then you take away all the observations, and then uh, you just have an AMA pro or you just have a model integration, which is very cheap as well. You don't have to do any data simulation, so it's really cheap to add that, and that from that uh, from itself, you can already learn a lot. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think we, um, so we had done that for earlier versions of 20CR and those studies were actually really useful and we didn't do that for version three. Uh, and you're right, I should have included that in this, in this talk because that I think can very easily get to some of those model biases in particular. Yeah. Another question from Mark Rodwell, go ahead. There. Yes, um, I'm just wondering whether an, a slightly different approach to, um, rather than sort of doing very long um, sweet, um, data assimilations, um, I wonder whether it would be, be more useful to do a, a sort of a much larger suite of reanalyses, but over just the sort of more recent period. So you could sort of um, mirror the, um, the data content of the older periods, um, you know, you know, sort of each decade you could sort of um, get um, you could sort of thin down the current observations to to, to represent that 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 previous period, and then you might get a better idea about the uncertainties um, that are inherent in that in those earlier periods. Yeah, I think that um, that could also really get towards some of the model biases and observation biases if that's your goal. Um, I guess what I'm thinking is a sort of you know, two-pronged approach to be able to uh, have that as well as having longer time series. So the the sparse input reanalyses that I'm thinking of would never assimilate the satellites. And so you would still have, um, I guess it would still be denser. And so it would, let me think, yeah. I, yeah, I guess there's there's two different ways to go about it. You could just take the modern time period uh, and then remove satellites and then degrade your, for example, your surface observation network down to something that looks like 1850 and see what happens. Um, and I think that would be a good way to characterize the uncertainty, as you said, um, as well as potentially get at some of the model and observation biases in the modern time period. Um, but I still think there is a place for having a longer time series as well, um, you know, actually going back to 1850 and then forward or even earlier. But yeah, thanks. Good point. Thank you. There's another question online, but I want to see if anyone in the room has any questions. Sure to say your name and affiliation. 
um, Dan Amrine from NCAR, thanks a lot. That was a really interesting perspective. I just want to echo that I think these long time periods are really important for climate um, and that this is a you know, really frequent request we get is how can we extend these records back in time. Um, I've done a lot of work in the paleo space, so I'd be excited to have that conversation. I guess one thing that I think is characteristic of the paleo climate database is that it drops off very rapidly in time. You know, it's not so much a matter of maybe like a step function or a satellite being introduced, but I think network change is like a property of paleo DA. So, you know, do you see room in like a hybrid or, you know, sort of a blended thing as you're discussing um, where that could be taken to, into account and you wouldn't have to freeze the network necessarily? Potentially, yeah, I think um, potentially an approach that, that Mark was just suggesting where you take the uh, uh, well-observed period and reduce your system down. Um, or, you know, taking a period where we have some overlap between the paleo and the sparse input um, and figuring out the uncertainties and pot potential biases and errors there. Uh, and then maybe trying to take that into account and still uh, assimilating as much as possible into the paleo part of things. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah. So, Patrick Heimbach, and for these long integration, again, I, I agree totally that this is of real importance for the climate community. Two things. One is that because of the sparsity of observation, the, it's almost like a question of, you know, what are plausible um, trajectories, right? As opposed to what, 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 is the, what is the trajectory? And so the, it's almost the, the uncertainty quantification or the, 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 light, the probability distribution of plausible solutions is perhaps almost more important than, than providing a solution because just of the sparsity of the observations, that, that's one aspect. And then the second one, though, in the climate, we are looking for small, well, maybe not as we were very far back in time, but we're still looking for small signals in, in a very noisy system that has the, um, internal variability on, on all time scales. And so what the other important role here is also of the analysis increment that you always incur and to look at you know how big that actually is in because you're you're not tracking the energy evolution through the system you're not tracking the freshwater evolution through the system properly and therefore the, that's got to be as important also as the solution itself is that is that well discuss <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I, I totally agree. Um, I agree with your first point. I think that we've talked a lot about uncertainty quantification. I know Ron brought up in our smaller group discussion yesterday that it's really, you know, it's, it's easy to pay lip service to saying uncertainty quantification is important. Communication of it is important. Um, but we're really going to need to focus on that. And I think um, as we move towards integrated reanalyses, that's important. But also, as we go further back in time, it's absolutely necessary because it's really important especially to communicate to users that you can take the mean state of our reanalysis in 1810 but you have to know what you're getting like it is not a good estimate necessarily especially over certain places you're if you're trying to do climate studies in africa in the 1800s it's going to be very different than if you're trying to use our reanalysis to do studies over europe right um and um so i think having for us, I think that's why having the ensemble common filter with an ensemble of different states uh, is really important and having people know that, that they need to take that information into account is really important. Um, now I forget your second question, I'm sorry. <laughs> Analysis increments, yes, I think that's, yeah, I mean, we've been talking about that as well. I think that's important, as important in this context as it is in, in other contexts and, and gets at the same thing where if you don't have much of an increment, then you know you don't, you know, if you don't have observations, you're not going to have much of an increment. You're going to have, it's basically a model simulation. Yeah, I think that's, it's important to keep in mind too. Let's take one final question online. Sorry, Sergey. I see you standing up. We can talk later. Um, <laughs> Kevin Bowman, is there relevance value to comparing these results to SIGMET 6 models? They are being, uh, they are being run over similar time periods. Um, yeah, I mean, we, so we haven't done much of that. We've compared you know, and the, the plot I showed had CMIP5, um, and we haven't 
you know, we haven't updated it to CMIP 6, but I do think that's important as um, I think there's uh, space for these reanalyses to, um, to, to help illuminate, you know, errors and biases in CMIP 6 and vice versa. Yeah. Great. Um, all right, should we move on to our next speaker? Laura, did you want to introduce them? Sure. Um, so our next speaker, I am assuming is virtual, is uh, Bill Bell from ECMWF, uh, and he'll be discussing uh, needs and opportunities for data rescue and reprocessing. Thanks very much, Laura. Can you see the presentation? Yes. Yep, we're good. Thanks. Okay, uh, morning everyone, um, and thanks to the organisers for this opportunity to tell you how we've uh, set C3S up to support data rescue and reprocessing. So my uh, co-authors here are the members of the reanalysis team based at ECMWF, the climate team based at UNETSA engaged in reprocessing, and members of a consortium um, led by Spacia Limited based in Toulouse engaged in satellite data rescue. So I really hope there's something in here um, that's of interest and, and useful as you formulate your plans for next generation US analyses. Uh, let me just see if I can get the pointer to work. So an overview then, I wanted to briefly in four slides recap the, the value of reprocessed data um, in era five and look at the, the value of rescued early satellite data um, through the example uh, era five again. So in the main part of the talk, I really wanted to, to illustrate how we'd set ourselves up to, to support the rescue and reprocessing, not only of conventional data, but um, satellite data. And I'll declare a, a coverage bias from the outset that the main focus here will be in satellite data. And then I wanted to come back to some of the questions that have been raised by the the organising committee, and specifically to pick up in the issue of uh, resources, which leads to a consideration of how we collaborate, and then highlight some of the specific scientific challenges that faces reanalysis. So we we often use the forecast skill. Uh, as a proxy for our analysis performance or analysis quality. So I've shown here uh, the ERA 5 reforecast scale going back to 1950 in four subcontinental regions. So the bold line at the top shows you the ERA 5 skill, and from 79 onwards, you've got the ERA interim skill. So this is uh, the forecast range at which Z500 anomaly correlation drops below these thresholds indicated in blue orange and green. So the point here is that the skill gains that, that we realise uh, depend on a number of developments. Firstly, the increase in compute power that's available that enables us to run at higher resolution. Secondly, the decade of forecast model and DA developments that take place, uh, in this case, ECMWF. And then finally, the improved use of observations. So the use of reprocessed observations, but also improvements in the observation operator and the detailed DA configuration that we use to exploit those observations. So reanalysis really sits on a much larger effort devoted to medium range NWP. Um, the skill gains uh, in time are of course dependent on the evolving observing system. So it enables you to sort of calibrate the expectations that you have from reprocessing any specific data set. So we expect incremental gains through reprocessing observations and possibly through the example of the, the early 70s where we used uh, VTPR data and then saw the big leap forward when we assimilated TOPS data. You know, it points to the larger gains from using previously unused data, um, either in that early satellite period or during the modern satellite era. Uh, using data that, for whatever reason, uh, wasn't used previously. Very briefly, then, uh, in ERA 5, we made extensive use of reprocessed data. So these are um, all of the satellite data sets that we assimilated post-79, and the blue bars indicate data sets where uh, there was reprocessing or we used the data in a, a quite significantly different way relative to ERA interim. So, of course, all of these data sets are evaluated through 
uh, OSI's um, prior to production. Just another metric here showing you the value of, of early satellite data. So we use an EDA as a proxy for our analysis errors. And you see that over time, uh, at any level, that decreases monotonically. But that overall picture is punctuated by these uh, step change improvements, where there are significant changes in the observing system. So the introduction of ETPR in late 72, TOVs, ATOVs, and then particularly in the stratosphere post-2006, uh, with the introduction of the cosmic RO data. The panel on the right shows uh, another metric that's indicating that benefit of the early satellite data. So it's showing the standard deviation of first guest departures in the Southern Hemisphere for surface pressure in black. And it's showing that when you assimilate VTPR data, you get a significant improvement in the background as observed by the surface pressure network. And then another jump when you introduce the TOPS data. Just one final point I wanted to, to bring up here, and hopefully there'll be time to come back to it. Um, we really benefited from collaboration with uh, GMA on using VTPR. So the real nitty gritty details of how you optimize the cloud detection, how you tune your observation errors, the blacklisting and the RT modeling really benefited. And I think the general point is that collaboration doesn't supercharge your R&D program, but it really accelerates it and it de-risks it. And it does that because it's very difficult to get these configurations right first time. And if you can collaborate, then it really um, pushes things on. So focus till now on the sort of synoptic accuracy as a performance metric, but of course many of our users are interested in the evolution of the mean state. So I'm showing in the top panel here the evolution of anomalies relative to era five climate from eighty one to two thousand ten, and temperature from the surface up to one hectopascal. And what you see is that above ten hectopascal, there's a number of step changes in the mean state that are evident. And these step changes result from um, an interplay between model bias and the changing observing system. Patrick, in the next talk, uh, will cover those model biases in a bit more detail. But those uh, same issues affect us lower down. There's a well-documented problem that, that made us run ERA 5.1 to address problems in our lower stratospheric temperatures. So the, the aspiration is that through the use of uh, better intercalibrated satellite data, we at least contribute to solving that, that general problem of dis discontinuities. So how have we set up in, in C3S to support uh, rescue and, and uh, reprocessing? In the context of the conventional observations, we support a range of activities um, ranging from um, preserving the original raw data to digitizing that, to assessing the data quality, improving the data records, archiving them uh, in common data standards, and making them available to the public through uh, the Copernicus Data Store. In the context of the early satellite observations, the focus is on pre-1979, uh, mainly the Nimbus satellites. It builds very much the NASA Pathfinder activities, similar activities at NOAA. Um, the activities there span data formatting, quality assurance and archiving, but right through to the evaluation relative to ERA-5 um, and the evaluation of bias model. Um, this is before delivery to us in order that the data is uh, more assimilation ready. And then finally, the reprocessed observations, the focus there is that the long-term operational missions, mainly post-79, it's delivered by UMETSAT, and that, that program we're working to at the minute was really defined through a very comprehensive review of requirements and capabilities. Touching on the, the early satellite data rescue, then, um, I've mentioned our use of VTPR and the benefits we realised from that. The blue boxes here represent data sets that have been recovered in the first uh, Copernicus phase that ended last year, and the red boxes indicate those sensors that will be tackled in the next phase. So you can see there's a, a reasonable 
it's smattering of early satellite data sets that we would hope to extract some benefit from in ERA-6 and subsequent reanalyses. Just to pick up some examples from the, the work done so far, the temperature and humidity infrared sound are in Nimbus 4. Uh, exhibited significant geolocation problems in the polar regions. Uh, the consortium led by Spasia and involved in the University of Reading um, really improved in that uh, and the data sets much better as a consequence. Uh, the panel on the left shows BTPR, which we've already assimilated. Uh, a close inspection of that data shows that there are also significant geolocation issues. And the aim is that in phase two of uh, C3S, we use the same techniques developed for THIR to improve the geolocation. This next example is showing um, how the early temperature sounding data from SIRS, which is a multispectral instrument, and IRIS, an early hyperspectral instrument, are really highlighting problems in uh, ERA 5. But the top row shows uh, channels in both instruments that peak about 50 hectopascals. In the lower stratosphere, these are 2D density plots that show um, observed minus uh, analysis differences uh, versus latitude. So, south of 50 south, you see this uh, O minus A negative bias indicating uh, warm ERA 5 analyses in the polar winter. Uh, you see it in 69, you see it in 1970 uh, from SIRS, and you see it in IRIS as well. So. We've got a fair degree of confidence that because both instruments are seeing it, it is a real bias issue. The amplitude there is about 5 Kelvin. The bottom row shows uh, some channels that peak slightly higher, between 2 and 30 hectopascals. And there you see a similar effect. If anything, the, the amplitude of the bias is even larger at um, 10 Kelvin or greater. So it points to the, the value of this this data from the late 60s and early 70s in our next gen reanalysis. Finally, the medium range resolution infrared uh, radiometer exhibited uh, geolocation issues, which were solved. Um, if you look at the biases relative to ERA 5, the data quality is good. Uh, the biases are non zero, but they're manageable. And then finally, uh, what they did was develop cloud screening methods. Um, using the, the visible near-infrared channels, which should um, accelerate our, our use of that data in, in future reanalyses. On then to the reprocessed data. Uh, in the first phase of Copernicus, UMETSAT delivered several uh, reprocessed data sets. So FCDRs for radiances listed here. All of the main RO uh, operational data sets, uh, AMVs from the the European Geo uh, Meteosat and Polar Winds from AVHRR and ASCAT SCAT Winds. And we're in the process of evaluating all of those data sets through um, OSSEs. Uh, and I've shown in the, the right hand panel some examples of results from those OSSEs. So um, for NOAA 6 and TROS N HERS in the second half of 1979, when you use the reprocessed data, the background fits improved uh, significantly for those channels. And interestingly, the mean state that you analyze uh, shifts. So in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, low troposphere, extra tropics, you've got a shift of about 50 millikelvin, which is considerable for climate trends. Two minutes. Uh, thanks very much. So the, the GRASS data uh, from GRASS A uh, shows improvements in the background fits. We get more observations through. We're repeating these uh, process uh, OSSEs for the other RO missions. When you look at independent data sets, um, in this case, AMSU A stratospheric channels and ATMS stratospheric channels, you see that the grass has improved in the stratosphere. Um, working to the next phase of the current, the second phase of C3S, units that are working on delivery of long term data sets for these sensors. Uh, SSMT is a DMSP temperature sounder, never used in any of our reanalyses before, so that's particularly exciting. Uh, they're also working on high resolution uh, AMVs from uh, rapid update, rapid scan um, Meteosat data. They're looking at a host of early uh, satellite data sets, and then resources permitting, uh, they will relook at MSU and AMSU A 
specifically aiming to reduce the biases, which are quite significant. So, in the last uh, 30 seconds or so, I, I've tried to address uh, as many of these questions as possible, but in the interest of time, I'll just pick up on um, some of the questions that you've posed. The most significant barriers to progress in the field of reanalysis. I think in terms of resource, um, compared to the much larger effort focused on Operation WNWP, our resources are relatively uh, small. Um, but set against that, there are some significant scientific challenges for reanalysis that will probably never be a priority for Operation WNWP. Uh, the discussion after Laura's talk uh, touched upon the mean state uncertainties. I think that's that's going to be a big problem for us that we need to address going forward. Um, developing and testing the observation operators and DA configurations for historical sensors will never be a priority for Operation WNWP. So the pre 79 satellite data, but also recent research and operational missions that, for various reasons, timeliness or the lack of a mature observation operator, have meant that they've never been used in NWP, but are potentially of value for us. Uh, so that brings us to effective modes of collaboration. My impression is in atmospheric reanalysis that, compared to real time NWP, it's a relatively solitary activity. So, in the context of satellite data, uh, there are a number of working groups uh, the TOVS working group, the RO working group, the WINDS working group, the precipitation working group that are really very, very active and very effective, not only at the exchange of detailed information that enables everyone to optimise their configuration and realise benefit quickly. But also the strategic decisions in the observing system. I don't think there is a formal equivalent for conventional OBS, and the components related to historical observations of relevance for our activities are pretty fringe, and I think they could probably be strengthened. Other groups exist, G6, for example, um, CEOS Working Group in Calval, they're very active, but they're less DA focused and probably further away from the Reanalysis coalface, but we could possibly strengthen links there. Post pandemic modes of meeting offer an opportunity to strengthen our collaborations, but the overarching question, maybe for wider discussion at the meeting, is what's really the appetite for collaboration? And with that, I'll probably uh, leave it and, and thanks for listening. Thanks very much, Bill. Um, I think that followed on nicely. Uh, do we have any questions in the room or online yet? Uh, so just sort of a quick question for me, how much of that pre-satellite or the pre-1979 early satellite data um, would be useful for like observing the ocean? I'm, I'm not a, an expert in that by any means. Observing the ocean, so SST and ocean surface winds and those kind of parameters. Yeah, I guess I'm thinking about um, moving towards ocean atmosphere coupled in some way reanalyses um, and ideally going back further than 1979. And I'm wondering how many of those observations would be useful um, for those efforts. <clears throat> that's that's a good question. Many of those early satellite data sets are high resolution imagers. So the focus is in observing the surface, and with our current assimilation schemes, that really presents a challenge for using them in atmospheric reanalyses. However, there's a lot of work at ECMWF and elsewhere to really make better use of the interface observations that have got cross sensitivities between atmosphere and ocean, and these sensors fall into that category. So I don't think we'll be able to exploit those data sets fully in the near future. But looking a bit further forward, they probably will be important. Great, thanks. Uh, Kathy? Um, just a comment. Um, I'm sure most of you probably know about reanalysis.org. Uh, not everybody does. It's a website that's uh, intended to gather together all different topics relating to reanalysis. And I'm going to add some content relating to some of the stuff I've heard during the meeting so far. But I invite you all to look at it and um, 
potentially join it and add to it if you can, and we can um, try, you know, integrating some of these things that were just talked about, um, you know, try to uh, have people work together more and put the collaborations down and so forth. Thanks. Great, thanks. Uh, any other questions or comments? Okay. Thank you, Bill. This was a very thought-provoking talk, and I, I'm not ready to ask a very specific question at this point. But one thing that intrigued me was, you know, you finished that we need to have more conversations about collaborations, and you mentioned that in other areas um, of science, you know, there's established working groups, and there is really no working group for reanalysis. Is one suggestion that you're making that we should find you know, work maybe with WMO to establish something like that? Um, well, well, I should say, and I meant to say it during the talk, I, I don't think there is zero collaboration in our community. I think there is collaboration, but I think we could gain from uh, strengthening those collaborations. Um, my, my suggestion would be to piggyback on those established groups but through the exam, through the subgroups that function within them on climate, we could really bolster the, the reanalysis focus and really encourage, you know, people from our community to attend those meetings and use those groups as a forum for exchanging real detail on uh, how to squeeze the most out of uh, observations. Um, so, so that would be my suggestion, but, but it's a discussion really. There are options, but I think there's a, a lot of scope for us maybe um, strengthening those collaborations if there's an appetite for it. Yeah, thank you, Bill. All right, thanks. Um, let's move on to our next speaker is Mark Rodwell, uh, and he'll be discussing interaction of model development and reanalysis production. Ah, is that better? <laughs> Perfect. When I was sharing, I'm afraid uh, all the all the buttons disappeared. <laughs> um, yes, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. So, um, well, Bill was talking about reanalysis being a fringe activity. And I'm I'm sort of on the fringe of the fringe, if you like, uh, and it's always amazing to see how much work goes on in reanalysis. Um, I work in uh, diagnostics at the European Centre, so mainly looking at the operational forecast system and uh, the various experimental suites of that. But uh, so I've got a sort of a very suite of diagnostics and I've applied them to era five. And uh, I think it's fairly they're a useful set of extra diagnostics compared to or in addition to the ones that are done routinely by the reanalysis people themselves. So uh, that's what I was going to show today. So I just thank basically the creators and the the archivers of era five for the for the data. And I would stress the archivers because um, a lot of the data I'm looking at here is is sort of observation feedback data, which is is really quite tricky. And uh, we, you know, we sort of argued if we could or pleaded with them to archive some of this data, and they have at least for the conventional observations. And I think it's really useful um, as uh, for you know for diagnosis of reanalysis. Um, so um, let's get rid of that. Um, so. I'm looking in observation space um, and I'm only looking at surface pressure observations, conventional surface pressure observations. So they come from things like buoys and um, and um, ship observations and that kind of thing. Uh, this is just looking at the, um, so we have the ensemble of data assimilations, the EDA, which is used within uh, era five. Um, but here I'm just looking at the, the control member, so the unperturbed member of, of the EDA just to look at some sort of deterministic um, aspects. Um, so what I'm showing here, and I'm showing for a whole decade, so this is the, the sort of most recent decade, 2010 to 2019, we've got the observation density. Uh, so you can see lots of observations over North America and, and Europe and, and elsewhere and sort of lower observations, uh, lower observation densities um, in other places. But I would certainly, with a, an average over a whole decade, you see that you do get pretty good global coverage. Um, um, so a lot of places colored. Um, the next plot here on the top, the top middle is the bias correction. So we have a, a variational bias correction scheme that's applied in the in the model um, and various other sort of 
approaches to bias correction. And this is just the, um, what I'm showing there is the uncorrected observation minus the corrected one. So um, as in that sort of little formula on the left-hand side. Top right shows the, the, the observed value. So this is the mean over a whole decade. So it's, it's a lot of data. And you can see, for example, the subtropical anticyclones uh, features in the sort of yellow regions there. There's not a lot of detail in that one, I'm afraid, on this scale. The key <clears throat> plot um, is this um, left-hand middle plot, um, which shows the mean first guest departures. So that's the one I'll sort of focus um, quite a bit on. So that's looking at um, the, um, the difference between the corrected or the bias corrected observation and the, and the background. Uh, then you've got the analysis departure. So that's after the assimilation has assimilated those observations. And so it's drawn closer to the observations. So the analysis departure is obviously uh, less than the first guess departures in, in average. And then the middle right is then the analysis increment. So that's sort of basically what's being added to the background to get to the new analysis. And then the bottom plots, which I won't really concentrate on, just show the root mean square of those, um, of those three aspects. There's also some sort of summary um, statistics at the top of each panel showing the area mean value. So the, you've got the, the, the mean, you've got the RMS, and you've got this called, thing called SIG, which is basically the area which is significant at the 5% level. So the top left one, um, 86% significant at the 5% level. It's probably not a good one to think of in the observation density, but certainly for the first guest departures, uh, mean first guest departures, we've got 36% of the area significant at the 5% level. So it's sort of, you know, it's sort of field significant in that sense. So what are we actually seeing? If we look at the first guest departures, I've ringed some sort of key aspects here. Um, and in particular, we're seeing um, sort of yellow regions in the subtropical anticyclones. Um, so that's that's basically saying that the observed surface pressure is is systematically higher than the the background, and the opposite is true at the sort of head of the, the the two North Atlantic storm tracks and also in the southern hemisphere storm tracks. Um, so there's some kind of redistribution of mass um, sort of apparent in the model um, as you as you as you go forward. And I guess that these ringed areas are actually pretty important for climate in their own right. The subtropical anticyclones and the storm tracks are sort of key aspects of uh, climate uncertainty. So this is um, what it looks like for the most recent decade. So I'm going to step back um, a few decades to see how things evolve. Um, so if we go. OK, so if I go back to um, the 20, 2000 to 2009, um, you'll see that basically the first guest departures in those regions have strengthened um, quite a bit. Um, and if we go back to the 1990 to 1999, again, they've strengthened again. And uh, finally, I'm going here to the 1980s here, and they've got quite a lot stronger. So what is this saying? It's basically there's a trend in the mean first guest departures. And so there's likely then to be a trend in the initial initializing analysis for those background uh, forecasts. So there's a trend, uh, there's an analysis bias trend, a trend in the in the analysis bias going back in time. And uh, that's basically going to then lead to an erroneous component to the reanalysis trend. Um, whether that's significant compared to the sort of global warming trends or not is something to be evaluated. But clearly there is some um, erroneous trend associated um, as you go back in time. And I think I think this was this was talked about a bit yesterday, but I think the main aspect here is that there are sparser observations as you go back in time, and so the, the model bias starts to have a, a larger impact on uh, uh, in the in the assimilation scheme, and so you're seeing the, the the effect of the model bias much more as you go back in time. So that sort of suggests that there is would be it would be useful to have a representation of model error, systematic model error which maybe you can derive from the most recent period and you know apply it in the sort of weak constraint approach that I think Patrick's going to be talking a lot more about next um, uh, back in back in time. Um, there's also another aspect here which is which is quite interesting. Um, if you look over the, the the bias correction, particularly over the Atlantic region, then the bias correction has actually increased a lot as you go back in time as well. 
Um, and what that seems to be saying to me is that our bias correction scheme is actually mopping up quite a bit of the systematic first guess departures. If you the, the bias correction and the first guess departures here basically add up in that sort of formula on the left hand side. So it suggests the problem could be somewhat worse. And uh, so not only do we need to take account of model error, but we also perhaps need to tune our bias correction scheme so it doesn't mop up um, the model error um, uh, or, you know, sort of attribute um, model error to um, uh, to observation um, bias. So that's that's looking basically at the sort of deterministic system um, and, you know, the idea that we should reanalysis could benefit from having a model error representation and perhaps some tuning of the observation bias correction. So now I was going to move on to the sort of more um, ensemble side of things. So the sort of uncertainty aspect, uh, I won't sort of dwell on this one a lot, but the top left um, equation is just the, the well known error spread equation that you want to get right in a forecast. So the T is the truth. So you basically that you the idea is that the truth should be indistinguishable from another fork ensemble member of the forecast. And so basically um, the mean squared error of the ensemble mean um, should be the same as the uh, as the ensemble variance. And so to, I've just put this R to sort of close the budget, but the idea is that if the system is reliable, then uh, as I say, the truth is indistinguishable from the forecast members. And that would imply that the residual would tend to zero as you as you increased your sample size, basically. Now, the problem in data simulation, as uh, as many of you will be aware, is that we don't really know the truth well enough to uh, work out that error term. And we have to so we have observations and we have observation uncertainty. And so the sort of middle equation on the left hand side is trying to take account is the same, same equation, but trying to take account of um, the mean bias, which I've removed on the left hand side, but also the um, the observation uncertainty, which I've added to the um, to the, the background forecasts. Um, uh, so you end up with a, a slightly different equation. You can just basically rearrange that um, equation to give you the bottom left one, which is just Rather similarly, you've got the mean squared departures of the um, the, on, the ensemble mean from the observations, equaling the, um, the 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 variance of the background plus effectively the the variance of the observation error, and then again, reliability would you would want the the, the squared bias to be zero, ten to zero, and the residual to ten to zero. So this equation is going to be quite useful for sort of seeing whether we've got in an ensemble sense whether we've got the balance right between the the spread and the error and the uh, the ensemble uncertainty so well, that's what I'm, that's what i'm just showing here so um, this is basically the equation again for surface pressures um, this is for the most recent decade you've got the squared departures top left then you've got the ensemble variance and the observation uncertainty, the bias and the residual that all should add up basically to the, or well, they do add up to the departure. Um, the ensemble variance is quite small, which is um, maybe counterintuitive to some people, but you know, in data assimilation, the observation uncertainty is generally larger or can be larger than the, the background variance. But nevertheless, you see that there's quite large positive residuals, particularly in the storm track regions. I think suggesting that the the background variance is perhaps not sufficient um, to fully represent um, fully represent the departures. So um, whether that's due to aspects of the model, for example, we don't we don't use singular vectors in the in the EDA. Um, we don't fully represent the model uncertainty with the stochastic physics in the in the boundary layer very well. Another interesting factor here is if you look at the residual, you can actually see the ship tracks in the residuals. Um, you can see the sort of yellow lines in the, in the tropical regions, indicating that probably we're actually um, we're, we're too optimistic about the, the errors of these ship observations and perhaps a bit pessimistic about the buoy observations. That's quite interesting. You can see that. OK, so I'm just going to rescale the residual um, just so that I can compare it now with um, previous decade so it sort of shrinks down a little bit so let's go back in time so so this is now um the previous decade 
Um, and what we see is that the assigned observation errors have increased and the background variance has increased, but it doesn't still doesn't keep pace with the, the increasing departure. So we end up with a stronger sort of yellow red residual term. Again, we go back to the 90s and the, the same thing happens, particularly over the Southern Ocean. You can see the sort of red region here. So finally, uh, in the 1980s, it's really pretty, pretty strong. So there's a trend of increasing under spread, basically. Um, there's a trend that the spread is increasing as you go back in time. The ensemble variance is increasing, but not sufficiently to, to represent um, the, the real uncertainty in the, in the ensemble. Um, so questions are, you know, what is this due to? Is it due to, a, you know, over um, prescribed SSTs as you go back or underestimation of early satellite? errors. Um, these things I, d I don't know any about. Obviously, Bill and, and other people look at that a lot more than me. Um, but I think it's um, it's useful to, to look at these diagnostic, apply these diagnostics to the reanalysis so it can inform the future reanalyses. So things that um, I've mentioned, um, I've mentioned uh, the sort of sparser observations going back leaves the reanalysis sort of at the mercy of, of model bias. And so, you know, Tackling that with a weak constraint data assimilation scheme um, is, is would be very useful in the next uh, reanalysis. Um, I guess to prevent uh, problems with the climate projection biases, though, we really need to improve the underlying model. Um, so that's sort of linked in with the weak constraint, but you know, uh, and attention to the variational bias correction too. And I guess the goal here, in terms of the deterministic thing, is to basically remove the impact of model bias on the on the uh, the on the reanalysis trends. For the uncertainty, it gets larger as you go back in time, but not large enough. It gives us a false impression of the accuracy of the product. It's This is also important for reforecasts because it means that there's going to be unreliable initialization of the reforecast, which will have impacts on, on how you use that in you know for the operational products. Whether this is due to, as I say, due to what Observation on sense, I don't know. I guess here the goal is really that you know to document the ine inevitable trends in uncertainty, so as Bill was mentioning, but to try to improve the reliability. And more sort of full, complete package of, of these um, diagnostics is available on that link there. So you're welcome to look at that uh, if you like. So I'll stop there. I'm sorry if I took a little bit too much time. Great, great. Thanks very much. Um, I think we have a couple minutes for questions. Uh, Dan? Uh, Dan Amrine from NCAR. Thanks. That was really interesting to see. Thank I you. had of questions. I guess the first um, was if you could speak, uh, if, you, if you're using any inflation um, to adjust the spread. And then the, um, the second question was about the partitioning between the bias term and the residual term. The bias, as you, you know, noted, lights up where you have observations, but could it be that the lack of observations, you know, especially in the Southern Ocean, is putting some of what is maybe actually time ensemble mean model bias into that residual, and could the use of a prior bias term help spread that out in space? Um, I think um, the, I'm not, what what we what you actually find is that the the bias is is fairly explicitly represented there as far as I understand. The only the, what isn't represented in the, in this term is the variations in the bias, um, and they and they do get included in the residual. Um, but I'm not sure if I fully understand your question. Does that? Well, I, you're defining the bias, if I understand, as the difference between the models. And the, and the observations. So it's yes. a function of where you have observations. Is that yes. right? Yes. So, yeah, there maybe there could be time mean differences um, between model and truth that you don't pick up on because you don't have observations there. So I'm wondering if some yes. of those things you could ex, you know explain the the huge residuals you get in the Southern Ocean. Um, I think I'd need to think about that. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously there, there is a difference between when you look at the, you know, the, the models, model space and the observation space, um, but looking at the first guest departure sort of creates some independence there. 
Um, so obviously the analysis departures of, you know, can be as small as you like, uh, depending on how you draw to the observations. I really don't think I'm answering your question very well, I'm afraid. Okay. Also, yeah. the, second, the first one was easier just about the inflation, whether you're using inflation. Um, no, I don't think there's any inflation uh, used in, in that way. Obviously, there is in the reef forecasts. Um, so, yeah, the, the reef forecasts, are, you know, are, there is some inflation there, um, as there is in the operational ensemble um, to, to, to sort of um, to inflate the EDA spread to the, to the right level. To, um, yeah, so that's usually inflated slightly, but um, not in terms of the EDA itself. Yeah, great, thank you. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and save other questions for the discussion section. Um, thanks a lot, Mark. And we'll move on to our last talk of the session, which is moving to in person. We have Patrick Lalio from ECMWF um, who will tell us how to handle systematic errors. Okay, thank you, Laura, and um, good morning, everyone. Um, so, yeah, I'll been working for the past uh, few years now about on uh, data assimilation methods to handle model biases. Um, initially, I've been doing that for numerical weather prediction. And recently, with uh, Bill Bell from Copernicus, uh, we started to work together to see how we can apply that kind of method for analysis. Um, yeah, so today in this talk, basically, I will show you the kind of data assumption method we've got, um, the one called weak constraint for DVAR, show a couple of results for NWP, and then I will spend the rest of the time um, to see what we can do for analysis. I'll just try to go to, oh, sorry, can I, can we just go back one slide? Yeah. Um, I don't know how to close that. Okay, so this slide is just to introduce um, model biases very briefly. Um, so, as you know, at ECMWF, we've got this Earth system model. Um, during this talk, I will just focus on the atmosphere. And here you've got a plot, which is a very long time series. So it starts in um, uh, 20, 2012. And I've plotted the difference between a 12 hour first guess from the atmospheric model um, with radio sounds. And it's just a way to highlight the model biases we've got in the atmosphere. Um, you've got the different pressure levels, so um, from the bottom of the atmosphere up to 5 hectopascal. And you see that over time, model biases have changed. Um, the first thing you can see is that um, they are larger in the stratosphere, uh, where you see these um, purple uh, patches. And you've got some uh, jumps over time as well. That's when we change our dynamical model. Um, so if we just uh, quickly look at uh, some of these jumps, the first one um, on yeah here, um, the first one happened when we uh, increased the vertical um, resolution. So actually, by increasing the vertical resolution in the model, the biases uh, reduced a lot. Unfortunately, over the years, you've got here a second jump and a third one here. Um, the model bias is increased um, because we increased the horizontal resolution and also uh, we made some changes in the radiative scheme. So the point is, um, even if the um, atmospheric model we've got at ECMBF is really good, we always have residual biases and we have to take into account these biases. Um, so the way we uh, do data assimilation is uh, using this uh, usually classic 4D VAR system uh, called strong constraint 4D VAR. The main point is in a strong constraint 4D VAR, we assume that the model is perfect. So basically, when we integrate the model in time, we don't take into account biases there. Um, what does it mean in terms of data assimilation? It's just you've got this schematic here. The only way um, you can improve the fit to the observations is by changing the initial state at the beginning of the assimilation window. The problem is that if you've got model biases, your model biases will be transferred into your analysis. And that's why uh, over the years, uh, we worked on a different solution called weak constraint for DVAR. Um, 
There is only one difference between strong constraint and weak constraint. In weak constraint for DVAR, we assume that the model is not perfect and uh, that we can correct for biases. So this time, when you integrate the model over time, actually, you can correct for the biases you've got in your model. So that's this eta forcing term, which is a 3D field correcting for temperature biases, for example. And what does it mean in terms of um, assimilating uh, observations? Now we've got two choices. You can either um, change the initial state to better fit the observations, or you can also apply a forcing at every model time step. And these two um, uh, fields are estimated at the same time when we minimize our cost function. So I don't go into more details, but you've got two papers here who are basically giving you all the, the details um, of the system. So what I want to do is just to show you how it works. Um, so soon, and in end of June of this year, we will celebrate uh, the two-year two anniversary of uh, we constraint for DVAR since we implemented the system in the whole stratosphere. And on the left-hand side, I show you basically um, the bias correction estimated by weak constraint for DVAR. And it's a time series of almost two years. It's, for, uh, it's between 20 hectopascal and 30 hectopascal in the stratosphere, and you've got the different latitudes. So that's on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, um, this is the model bias that has been estimated using uh, temperature retrieval. So we compare the 12-hour first guess from the model to temperature retrievals from uh, radio occultation that are very accurate. So it gives us a very a good picture of the kind of model biases we've got. And now we can look at some features that happened over the past two years. The first one you can see is in the southern hemisphere, where in December of each year, you've got this very sharp transition from a, a warm bias into a cold bias. So you've got that there, and you've got the same thing the following year here happening again. And the very good news for us is that we constrain is um, learning correctly that and picking up the, the transition at the right time and the right place. So that's a very good news. The other thing I want to highlight is here, you've got uh, a very, um, uh, uh, basically a, a synoptic event. So you've got a uh, sudden stratospheric warming, and then the model bias for a couple of days is just changing from being uh, cold to being warm. And once again, we constrain for DVAR, although it's been there only for a couple of days, picked up that correctly, and it's cooling down where the model was too warm. Um, so yeah, we are very happy with we constrain for DVAR, but as you probably know, um, people started to look at also machine learning solutions. Uh, we started a collaboration with NVIDIA uh, to, to see whether a machine learning solution could also uh, correct for model biases. Um, I don't have the time to uh, talk about all the details. Um, this paper has been accepted two days ago, uh, so you can probably find it somewhere. Um, and the results are promising with the machine learning solution, although at the minute, it doesn't outperform weak constraint for DVR. So now I want to spend some time to talk about reanalysis and what we can do for reanalysis. Um, you probably all know this uh, seminal paper from Dick D when he discussed uh, biases in data assimilation. And basically here, he's, uh, he made these two uh, schematics to show the problem that we all talked about since uh, the beginning of this meeting. So what's happening if you've got a bias in your model and you do uh, a reanalysis when the observing system is changing? So here, before 1979, you've got only a few observations. So you're only pulling a little bit your model towards the observations. And after 1979, you've got loads of observations. You're pulling the model more. And what it means in terms of strengths, you will basically introduce that spurious strength. The mean error in your analysis will be larger uh, before the satellite era and smaller during the satellite era. And what he showed in the paper is that if you're actually correcting for your model bias, um, the mean error you've got uh, will be the same and it's not, it doesn't depend on the uh, density of your observing system. 
so when do we have now at the moment in era five? So era five has not used weak constraint for DVAR because it wasn't ready by that time when they started the production. So as uh, Bill Bell uh, showed that before, um, if you look at here, uh, the monthly mean anomalies, you will see some jumps and all these jumps are basically coming from a change in the observing system. So the one here, it's when we start to assimilate uh, radio occultation observations, for example. The one there is in 1979 when we start to have the satellite era. Um, so we started to work with, um, with Bill Bell uh, to try to address this issue. And what we've done, the first thing we've done is just run a couple of uh, observing system experiments. Um, we've done that over uh, the year 2019. So we've got two observing system. We've got the full one with all the observation, the full observing system. And then the second observing system we've got is uh, an observing system where we removed all the uh, observations in the stratosphere. And then we look at the impact on the mean state. And that's what you can see here. So the red line, we've run a strong constraint for DVAR with the full observing system. And you see, if you just focus at 30 hectopascal, you see that the error in the mean state is 0.4 Kelvin. And then we've run a second experiment. So a strong constraint for DVAR, but uh, this time without uh, stratospheric observations. And you see that this time the mean error is 1.6 Kelvin. So, oh, can I just go back to the previous slide, please? Yeah, thank you. Um, so what you see is basically the impact when you've got strong constraint for DVAR. If you don't take into account model biases, you see the impact just by changing the observing system is, uh, is very large. It's 1.2 Kelvin. And that gives you basically the spurious climate trends you see in era five. Um, so with Bill, we started to think about that. Um, and um, this is the option we have uh, investigated over the past few months. So the idea would be to run weak constraint for DVAR over a recent period. So we've done that for the year 2020. So we've got one year of model error estimates. And uh, what we can do is to derive a climatology. Basically, we could do some monthly average. And then we can apply that climatology to correct the model over the whole reanalysis. Um, and um, we, we tried that for uh, the year uh, 2019. So um, you can see here the results. So first of all, if we focus on the red line, uh, the red line, we, uh, we use the full observing system, but this time the model has been corrected when we do the strong constraint for DVAR. Um, and you see that um, the, the mean error is 0.2 Kelvin. So by correcting the model when we do the reanalysis, um, the error before was 0.4 Kelvin and now it's 0.2 Kelvin. Um, and the black line, it's um, uh, the same experiment, but we don't have stratospheric observations this time. Uh, we are correcting the model using our climatology and the error is 0.5 Kelvin, so much smaller. The very good news is actually this time you see that between the two experiments, the difference is 0.3 Kelvin before it was uh, 1.4, I think. So actually by having that climatology and by correcting the model when we produce the reanalysis, the, the mean state is much less sensitive to a uh, change in the observing system. So we are quite hopeful that uh, this approach could uh, potentially sort out some issues we had in era five. Um, so yeah, um, it's time for me to wrap up. Um, I think the first thing I want to say is basically NWP and reanalysis, uh, we have a common goal. We want to produce the best analysis, which is really good because it means that when we develop research in NWP, most of the time, this could be applied in reanalysis too. Um, on the right-hand side, I just put um, the main results of the talk uh, and shows basically that if you correct for model biases when you produce a reanalysis, your mean state will be less sensitive to a change in the observing system. 
And the final comment I want to make is here, I only talked about model biases, but we all know that we've got biases in the observations as well, and they are equally important, but I haven't touched that topic. So yeah, I'll, uh, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. All right, thanks, Patrick. Um, do we have any questions in the audience or online? Patrick. Thanks, uh, Patrick, that was a great talk. I have a question going back to very early in your presentation. You presented the strong uh, 40 bar constraint um, or the weak constraint. There's another one option that's, that you're not considering is how, instead of only adjusting initial condition or allowing sources, is to um, estimate the parameters in the model, which, which would be a parameter calibration yeah. as part of the optimization. Um, and it could be pursued at least in conceptually within that framework. Is there, is there any thoughts? And in fact, the, the use of machine learning is in some sense in disguise is a parameter estimation problem, right? So is, are you planning or is there any ideas? To so yeah, some, some people are uh, looking at that where basically instead of estimating that forcing, they want to estimate the model parameters during the estimation. Uh, so it's ongoing. Um, it, it could work better. It, it's just a different approach. Um, you have to identify the parameters. But yeah, we know some of them, but maybe not all of them. Thanks. Sergey, and then run. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll make a f uh, feedback on um, Patrick's comment, well, Patrick Heimbach's comment. So I have an intuition that, you know, we had this very similar structure of our model parameterizations for a while. And people try to optimize them. And what we see is that the biases are inevitable. So I think if we keep trying to optimize the same parameters, structural parameterizations, it's hard to do it. It will be optimal over the globe. But there is work by groups like um, Tapio Shapiro that do change the structural forms of this, you know, some of the things become more state dependent. And I think that there is this hope that by, if we take the same parameterizations and just try to optimize them a little bit more, I don't think we'll take us all the way there. I disagree in part because there is, most um, centers have no formal calibrate parameter calibration model. So they, they're the parameter Adjustments are basically one person tweaking the parameter, which is not a formal parameter, you know, inference problem. And, and in particular, it's not one if you accept that parameters are spatially varying, like in the ocean, like a 3D mixing field or 3D parameterization of unresolved eddies. Then, um, and if you don't have a formal method of tackling that estimation problem, then you, then you're the statement that we are only making muted progress is, is not valid. I think that you actually agree, like for example, the especially varying parameters, you could not estimate them if you do it manually. That's why they were not specially varying. And if we do more formal estimation of them, then you can actually start estimating things that vary in space. So, so we actually agree with it. Uh, Ron? Uh, Ron Gelaro, NASA. That was a great talk. So Patrick, I, I want to see if I understand. You, you computed the weak constraint-based correction for 2020 and applied it in 2019. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I mean, the obvious question, have you applied it to so we, we, we've done that over 2019, so we can actually use the uh, temperature retrievals for verification. Uh, and that's, that's why we've done that over 2019. Obviously, the next step will be to try over, uh, you know, an older period. Yeah. I, I don't see why it wouldn't work. Yeah. But by doing that, the verification is not possible. It's hard, yeah. I just know... When we were preparing MERA, now not MERA 2, MERA, so this way back there, we were investigating methods, just not as sophisticated as we constraint, but just trying to use the increments to somehow produce a 
estimate, model estimate, bias estimate that we could try to apply over the whole range. And it definitely broke down as we <laughs> moved back in time to apply it. So it'll be very interesting to see if this can hold up. But yeah, it's promising. Uh, Mark Rodwell, you have a question? So it just goes back a little bit to that parameter estimation thing. It just strikes me that uh, certainly at the center and probably quite a few other places, they're moving to the um, stochastically perturbed parameters for for representing model uncertainty. And so this it's almost like there could be a whole industry there of um, using the same infrastructure for optimizing parameters to to um, improve the mean climate. Um, I don't know, it could be quite interesting to to look at that sort of re re regressing um, regressing uh, the analysis increments onto the parameter perturbations and looking at uh, uh, you know try, try to optimize pr parameters and and the, the those parameters are are sort of modified in different regions so again it could be sort of regionally um, used as well I don't know it's just a side thought. I, excuse me, this is Dan again. Um, I, in those D papers and D and De Silva, they describe a procedure for um, bias estimation sort of in parallel, I think, with the sequential ENKF where they're kind of carrying along um, an estimate of the model bias. Is something like that feasible um, here or is that not favorable for some reason? So could you say again what's been done in those papers? Um, they basically say, well, you know, in an ENKF system, you're estimating the state at each point, but you can also use the um, instantaneous estimates of the model bias to sort of update an yeah. estimate of the model. So, bias. yeah, it's yeah. it's very much the same okay, okay. idea and approach just done in the virtual context. Okay. But so, and then are you doing that online with a constantly, consistently evolving bias, or are you taking the bias from one time period and then looking at? So, the within one assumption window, the uh, model bias correction will be the same, yeah. but this will be updated at every single assimilation cycle. So that's why you've got uh, an evolving model bias correction. So yeah, I think it's very, very similar to uh, what you're describing here. Okay, thanks. So clearly, Patrick, this is creating a lot of discussion, even between people, and you don't even have to be involved sometimes. So this is, uh, so I, I want to ask a question about, in this concept of the weakly constrained, as you've applied it, in some respects, you're using the, the model term, the, the error term, as the kind of correction you would need, or you would get as a consequence of not having an observation available to you at that time by removing and including the um, stratospheric observations, right? Mm -hmm. So in some respects, the utilization of the weakly constrained um, 40 var is to try to predict what the increments would be if you had an observation there by having the statistics with the observations and without that observational network in your comparison. We follow that line of reasoning and then would, would the hope be that if you could train that appropriately as you work backwards in time into the early phases where you don't have the satellite record, you could still get a bias corrected version by being able to predict what you would have gotten mm -hmm. if you had had those satellite observations by developing the statistics on the model error term. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I, actually, it's a, it's a very good way and different way to explain the way it works uh, differently. Yeah. So, yeah, basically, that's what it's, uh, it's doing. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, this will be, oh, so, be, so then the goal would be to move beyond the stratosphere and then look at that longer term calculation of temperature, for example, across the satellite record into that pre satellite. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And, that, that's why we run weak constraint for DVAR when we've got a fully observed system. It's basically to get all the information from there, and then we apply that in a sparse system. And hopefully, as you said, it should do the same job.
All right. Um, any more questions for Patrick specifically? All right. Um, so we are moving into our discussion section now. Thanks, Patrick, and thanks to all the speakers. Um, so if there are any leftover questions from earlier uh, talks, let's go open it up, I guess, if anyone has any comments or questions or discussion starters. Sergey. I'd like to go back to, um, you know, some of the questions raised during your talk, Laura, about this hierarchy of um, um, reanalysis. It seems like one of the outcomes of this meeting in our report in a paper, we can articulate what that hierarchy might look like. Um, one thing that came up in our breakout group discussions yesterday is that there is not only a hierarchy in time, but also across applications. So, for example, carbon cycle reanalysis is kind of a sink on its own that sits on top of, you know, atmospheric ocean coupled reanalysis. And you might iterate on a carbon cycle reanalysis more frequently because you're developing it more actively. And I wonder if maybe Leslie wants to comment on it or there's any other comments from our audience so far what other angles on the reanalysis hierarchy we might develop in addition to just plain time? It's a really good um, question, and I think there's still some good discussion that we can have about that. But certainly, you know, carbon cycle is a place where you could think about um, having a separate reanalysis that, you know, it gives you more frequent or updates, like you say, or ability to manipulate and assimilate uh, vegetation parameters where you don't have to worry about degrading the meteorological performance. We have more flexibility there. And so I think it's, it's really figuring out the components. There's things we think we can run pretty tractably online. So ocean color um, it, with the aggressive push to, to atmosphere ocean. DA, that's something we can probably do. I think, you know, Cecile can speak to this as well. Um, so that's something that, you know, you could have running online. The, the um, atmospheric assimilation, the state assimilation is also pretty tractable, but there's certain components, particularly the land um, and maybe coupling between the land and the ocean, the riverine transport, where you would want to probably be doing that separately. And so I think there's some, some good discussions to be had about formulating what that plan looks like and how you move forward in a way that um, gets you a complete and consistent understanding, but also allows you to, to have some flexibility in how the, com the components are interacting. Kevin? I just want to follow up on what Leslie was saying. Um, the, the, in addition to the carbon cycle, um, atmospheric composition, air quality, or other really good examples of ones where you wanted, you could run more frequent reanalysis. But I think the way to think about the problem is there's a pragmatic trade-off between um, accuracy or fidelity and um, computational cost and between weak and strong coupling. So. The carbon cycle or an atmospheric composition, there is definitely coupling between different components of the Earth system. When you decouple them, so you have a one or let's say one way coupling. And one way coupling, the cost of running a particular process is, uh, is less, which gives you more opportunity to increase the fidelity or complexity of that component. So you think of a Bretherton diagram, you've got that component that you can sort of increase the level of effort. You can either add more observations like ocean color that Leslie's mentioning, or more other different types of observations, maybe SIF, uh, solar induced fluorescence. You could do more complicated assimilation systems uh, like MCMC in that single component that you could run more quickly. You want to have those running alongside, and then you would have that second step where you couple those back in where you can fully lock the two components in an interacting system, the residual, which should give you some information about the role of the coupling itself in the changing of the, the fields within some component, atmospheric composition, uh, carbon cycle, extended ocean, any one of these pieces. So I think when we think about that 
earth system analysis in terms of these streams where you trade off accuracy to coupling more sort of disciplinary fidelity and and sophistication versus the the additional accuracy of an earth, a coupled earth system piece and you can make trades in that regard and then you make decisions on how to move forward with those and so i think that would allow us to sort of have a wide range of options that could in, increase the return on investment of those initiatives. That's a good point. Leslie. <laughs> Generally agree on this. I think it's a, it's a really good point. I think the thing you have to think about if you're doing it with that strategy, what are the what are the qualities you need from the meteorological system so that you can do that credibly? And some we identified some of those challenges yesterday and you know mine and and Rolf's presentation, right? If you have those jumps and you're trying to run a land model, um, that may make it really, really hard if you haven't thought carefully about how to do that, um, you know, in the second reanalysis that you're feeding into, right, for the carbon cycle. So there's things like that. There's things like the fidelity of transport. This is something we worry a lot about, you know, uh, vertical transport, the carbon cycle representation in the atmosphere is quite sensitive to these processes. So there's, there's things you would want to be um, keeping in mind in designing the MET system so that you could feed this later. But I think absolutely having that approach where you've, you've got some more flexibility, you've got a two track system is probably the thing you're gonna end up with. And I think, you know, again, that's great. That's a big step forward for us. Any other comments or responses on that? Just one uh, follow up question. So, atmospheric composition, air quality, carbon cycle, uh, obvious um, candidates for that kind of hierarchy. Is there any other candidate that people want to air now that were included in the report? I guess those are the important ones. <laughs> cool. Um, any other questions or comments? Anything online? All right. Um, let's go ahead and uh, maybe take a look at the breakout questions, if that's possible. We can do that. Um, and so we'll have a break until 1040 our time. Uh, Sorry, until 11 o'clock our time, our time, actually, we're starting it a little bit early. Uh, and then we'll move to our breakout sessions and we will be discussing uh, some different questions from yesterday, more focused on technological opportunities and limitations, and hopefully um, bringing in some of the information from today's talks, uh, as well as everything we've, we've discussed yesterday. Um, so I think there's a slide with like all of them, maybe, you know, I'll let Jenny take over too. I don't think so. I think it's just oh, okay. these individual ones. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. All right. Um, well, great. Thanks everyone. Uh, and we'll reconvene in about 25 minutes. All right, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, we'll continue now with session two technological opportunities and limitations, um, to our, I guess, especially our European colleagues online. It's already a little bit late. So if you're still with us, we appreciate that. Uh, so the first speaker up will be Sergey Frolov, and he'll talk about different approaches to coupling. Thank you, Ron, for the introduction. As part of organizing committee, we thought we should actually cover some methodology of uh, data simulation and what it uh, takes to couple things in data simulation cycle. Um, there is a lot of people who contributed along the way to my understanding of this problem, and I'll try to provide references to their work through the presentation. Okay, so you saw, many of you have saw the slide before, so we have, I'll, I'll focus most on atmosphere and ocean as the most immediate problem we have. And a lot of these lessons will generalize to other fluids. So we have atmosphere and ocean, we have established the data simulation system for each uh, fluid. What we want to do in the couple data simulation world, we want to exploit cross correlations between fluids. And that becomes more important as we go to sparse renal, sparse and sparser observational periods where we cannot fully constrain even atmosphere. 
We also have uh, highly available satellite observations that are sensitive to both fluids. And that's again, very true of free analysis. We have decades worth of uh, satellite record that went under exploiting. So if you start working in the world of coupled data simulation, there's a lot of uh, historic uh, acronyms or names to it, quasi-coupled, weakly coupled, outer loop coupled. And it's very confusing. And I feel like we're actually gelling in a more um, nuanced understanding, that more unified understanding of what coupling means. And I'll talk you through it today. And maybe the way I'll walk through it today is I'll start with uncoupled reanalysis weakly coupled replay, weakly coupled reanalysis, stronger coupled reanalysis, and finally ending up with strongly coupled reanalysis, kind of describes the gradation of methods and what can be achieved with them. So let's focus on two kind of more uncoupled ones first. So the uncoupled reanalysis, that's what most of us are using right now in practice. It starts with SST observations, which will reconstruct an SST analysis, a standalone SST analysis, which is then used to force atmospheric analysis, which assimilates atmospheric observations, which then in turn feeds ocean analysis, which assimilates ocean observations. And this whole process is very loosely coupled. So first you'll produce decades of SST analysis and you'll feed it into decades of atmospheric analysis and then to decades of ocean analysis. And uh, there's nice, uh, there's many examples of um, why uncoupled tree analysis is limited. So I'm using a, a figure here from Patrick's paper when he compared uncoupled era 20C with coupled zero 20C. Uncoupled one is on the right, coupled one is on the left. And what you could see if you look at the coupled ocean atmosphere processes like uh, convectively coupled waves, they're completely absent in uncoupled tree analysis. Is that accurate summary of your figure, Patrick? Okay. So a step up from it is to do a weekly coupled replay. So this is something that we're planning to do for the next uh, uh, version of GFS and GFS transition for initialization um, reforecasts. Um, the replay methodology was uh, really pioneered at NASA. Um, I'm using here a figure from one of the papers that's in preparation in our group right now. But the idea is that you do a six hour, well, 12 hour forecast uh, from your initial condition. You compare this uh, forecast to an external analysis, like an era five analysis, and you compute the difference between the two. And then you rewind and start forecasts that has an increment term that bleeds in that difference between your original free forecast and the analysis. So uh, one way to think about it is nudging. It's just a different form to do nudging. So why why would you do that? And and what? So what you could do, you could take era five, which is uncoupled atmospheric reanalysis, or as five, which is uncoupled ocean reanalysis, and nudge a coupled model like a UFS to it. What we learned from doing this uh, replay experiments over multiple years that even if you take the same model, like on the right here, it was a GFS model, and you nudge it to the same analysis, like an ERA-5, but you change moist physics. What you start noticing is that your increments generated by replay are different. So the replay methodology itself actually can respond to changes in the model, even if you're nudging to the same external analysis. So, Progressing the sophistication of methods, if we go to the next step, so I'll, I'll write down an equation for an analysis. And many of you are, are either very, very familiar with it or not familiar at all, so I'll, I'll work through it. So we start with, um, uh, there's no uh, pointer, but we'll start going from the left. We're producing analysis based on the forecast. Yeah, it didn't, didn't come up. But that, that's okay. So we start with a forecast and we apply corrections to the forecast based on innovations. And some brackets disappeared along the way in this presentation. Um, apologies for that. But innovations uh, underlined with a bracket is a Y, which is observation, 
minus observation of the forecast from the previous analysis. And a common gain K maps these innovations into the space of the model. And if you, you know, as you start becoming more sophisticated of what kind of coupling you do in your reanalysis, you might have to write down the terms that go into the uh, K matrix. And I did write them out according to one of the formulations. And as we'll see later, depending on which of these terms becomes coupled, we'll have different flavors of the coupled reanalysis. So we talked about the weekly coupled um, data simulation and weekly coupled reanalysis. So the only thing that's coupled here is a model forecast and everything else is uncoupled, just like we'll do it in Euro 5 or in uh, ORS 5 or in MERA. An example of a weekly coupled uh, reanalysis is CFSR. And there are papers documenting that it's over a decade old, the CFSR papers, but there are papers documenting the benefit of uh, going to a weekly coupled tree analysis. And a very good example here is not from CFSR, it's from European Center when they were looking at coupling of um, a forecast model. You could see that uh, the climatology of uh, TCs, tropical cyclones, is significantly better in a weekly coupled tree analysis than in a coupled, uncoupled tree analysis. Other examples will be tropical wind SST coupling, for example, the earlier figure from Patrick, and we also saw it in the NRL um, um, system, and the ice extent predictions are also benefiting from coupled forecast and coupled reanalysis. So the next step up is um, data simulations uh, through a coupled 40 bar outer loop, and it's something happened, sorry for the slide. Um, so you cannot actually see um, the extra terms, but what happens is that the only thing that's coupled in the outer loop is still a coupled forecast model, but because you're iterating over the same um, period of time, you have this extra term that also becomes coupled. And I'm really sorry that uh, slides don't show that. So there was a, a sequence of papers written about the benefits of outer coupling, outer loop coupling. So the left and the middle panels um, show how, for example, atmospheric wind measurement makes an increment in atmosphere, but also through a mixed layer of the ocean and adjusts where the mixing is happening in the ocean. And the central panel shows how an SST measurement improves not only the ocean mixed layer, but also atmospheric boundary layer. Some of the limitations of the outer loop coupling, it, it actually takes a system about 12 hours to come in balance when you increment ocean and atmosphere in unbalanced ways. And the benefit of the outer loop coupling in a serial-like system that you had 24 hours to come in balance and that worked very well. But if you do have very short assimilation windows like most of us do, the outer loop coupling might not be sufficient to actually, like you do need these longer windows for simulation. So I'll skip through multiple steps and go to the completely coupled system. So nobody has that implemented yet in anything that's operational looking. So the things that get coupled, not just the forecast model, but a tangent linear model and a joint of observation operator, um, tangent linear joint of forecast model, if you use that, and initial time covariance matrix. I would like to highlight just a couple of um, things that I think are important for the reanalysis world. So one of them is a coupling through observation operator. So for example, here I'm taking an image from Alan Gear. He's uh, showing um, so-called uh, microwave imager channels. So microwave imagers go back to 1970, I can't, you know, I don't remember off the top of my head, but around 1980s, we have a long record of uh, microwave imagers and they're sensitive to a lot of things ocean waves, winds, skin temperature of the atmosphere in the ocean, skin temperature of ice, skin temperature of land, snow cover, land moisture. So there are sensing a lot of components of the Earth system, but our operational systems are only capable of extracting a few things out of it. They're circled out in purple circles or 
uh, yellow circles depend if it's used in atmospheric or ocean data simulation system. So improvements of use of all sky, all surface information in historic observations is a great opportunity to use this very rich archive of uh, historic observations. And if you look at NWP, you might not see this benefit if you look at um, um, the modern observing system, where we have very rich observing systems that can compensate for this underutilization. Another example will be going even further back in time, sparse input uh, reanalysis. And here's an image uh, courtesy of Laura Slavinsky. She plotted an answer like signal in 20CR version 3. And you can see that the climatology of that signal changes uh, dramatically around uh, 1870. And so what happens is that before that, well, after that date, um, Hadley SST has been used as a input to the 20CR. And before that, it was loosely coupled through a soda sparse input reanalysis. And I think what this image suggests that without having a process like Hadley SST reconstruction, you cannot really recover the answer signal. The difficulty is that if you on the right, you're plotting, you can plot an answer anomaly in SST, which is a top figure, and uh, sea level pressure, which is a bottom figure. So what you see is that to actually observe the ANSO signal in SST, you have to sail a ship through tropical East Pacific cold town to see that signal. It's really hard to observe it with um, early 19th century measurements unless you have a boat in the middle of the Pacific at that time. However, if you look at the surface level pressure signal, you see a very large dipole, well, you can extrapolate it, but you could see a very large dipole between places around Australia and places like West US West Coast. And there are reliable surface pressure records going into deep into 19th century that observe sea level pressure in Australia and in the US West Coast. The hypothesis is that if you can actually combine simulation of SST, ship track records and sea level pressure from early 19th century, you'll be able to reconstruct and so much better than existing process of you rely on ship track records alone. So conclusions, next versions of major reanalysis will be weakly coupled for atmosphere, ocean, ice, and land. I'm thinking specifically era six, era three, no, no replacement for CFSR. It's unclear what is the best strategy for other components of the system, such as composition, carbon biomass, biogeochemistry, maybe replay to atmospheric, ocean coupled reanalysis with this composition centered reanalysis is a good strategy. Stronger coupling will require sustained efforts for translating advances in all sky, all surface simulation from NWP system to historic periods. And we also need to sustain efforts in modern and exploiting coupled covariances. We're just learning how to work with coupled covariances. Um, I do have answers to a couple of questions. Um, that uh, organizers asked me to report on. Um, so what do you see as the most significant advances for the field of reanalysis in the next five to 10 years? So advancements in the methodologies that they can extract more information from historic sparse observations. That, that will be a progress that we can make if we invest into it. And also production of fully coupled reanalysis. And by coupled, I mean ocean, atmosphere, ice, land. What do you see as the most significant barriers to progress in the field of reanalysis? Computational cost poses a significant barrier for um, us iterating and improving over reanalysis, but also meaningful ways to share cost of development and production across centers. We're replicating a lot of work that slows us down, and it will be great if we can find a way to cut down duplication of effort. Which collaborations need to be fostered? I think there's a lot of opportunities in private-public partnerships, including um, sharing of observation data um, and uh, reanalysis output on cloud platforms and ease of access. 
but also collaborations between reanalysis centers. And hopefully tomorrow's sessions, we can engage in a discussion of what that might look like. Okay, thank you very much. Back up here. Yeah, I see Hans has a question, so go ahead, Hans. Yeah, so thank you, Sergey. I guess, Jenny, we do have questions. Yeah, Hans yeah. has this question. I, I mean, we have time. Yeah, let's take this one question, then we'll move on. So, Hans, go ahead. So, thank you so much for your presentation. Really great. Uh, my question is that uh, compared to the, 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 the fully coupled reanalysis, and uh, what extra do you think you gain compared to the not so fully coupled uh, methodologies do we have? Are we going to win a lot or is it more or less marginal? So between the two, what do you think? And also, uh, do you see that there's a risk that if you start to model these covariances, uh, that, that you could have that systematic model biases and comp component A could deteriorate the state of, of, of component B? Great questions, Hans. I think as we go back in time, um, coupling will become more important because we want to exploit all the information we have. And I think we're under-exploiting it right now, as the two examples that I showed. Um, and, you know, observation operator coupling is a very important one, um, probably the most important one to tackle first. Uh, as for coupled covariances, I mean, we should tackle systematic biases. Uh, it's not, <laughs> I, I don't think that coupled covariances will make systematic biases worse in the analysis. Um, I, I might be wrong. I, I, that, that's something that we should work as a community through. Maybe, maybe it will make things worse, but that just is an opportunity to reduce these coupled biases. Okay, thank you very much, Sergey. Very nice rundown of um, sort of the hierarchy of, oh, there's hierarchy again. Um, okay, so our next speaker will be Patrick Heimbach. Um, oh, well, I guess all the organizers are speaking this session, um, and he'll talk about the trade offs between accuracy and dynamic balance in your analysis. Uh. Thank you, Ron. Uh, so I'm now taking on the, the perspective of a uh, person who applies these ocean reanalysis. I'm an oceanographer and uh, trying to highlight on um, how we use these products or how we would like to use these products for understanding uh, ocean dynamics on, you know, uh, seasonal to interannual decadal timescales. So next slide, please. And so for, for this, uh, basically this, what's the merit and how do we use the, the capability of models, right, to balance the, the budgets of freshwater heat, so in general tracers and also momentum, um, and how we can really learn a lot from really doing some of these detailed analysis, but also how um, you know certain approaches will really hinder us to to do this. So it will be a little bit provocative. This presentation mainly showing many ways on how we can fail doing this. So next slide, please. And so the. Uh, yeah, these are just five examples that I'm going to give from basically global mean heat flux imbalances that probably most of you are aware to look at um, <clears throat> at um, water mass transformation in the ocean, which is really of importance for us uh, ocean climate community um, to um, really sort of on short time scale the 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 um, the impact of unobserved but diagnosed processes that may be very important for if we couple, for example, ocean models with biogeochemical models. So next slide, please. Um, so the, the first one is that probably most of you are familiar with, but I'd like to really point this out because many people in the community are actually not familiar with the fact that the, uh, these reanalysis products, if we take you know, global mean quantities that are very well constrained, presumably, uh, actually have very large imbalances that make them very difficult to use. So for, if we first take the, the right, so the atmospheric reanalysis, this is the global net heat flux imbalance. Uh, we know from certain, you know, from other types of observations that the 
the Earth planetary heat imbalance is somewhere just below one watts per meter square. Let's say the latest numbers on the order of 0 0.7, 0 0.8 watts per meter square. Um, and the in the global, um, so for the for the last let's say two decades or so, these annual mean global net uh, heat imbalances. You know, very widely go up to 25 plus minus 25 watts per meter square. The same is true for some of the ocean models that uh, potentially have been forced with uh, these reanalysis products again, or have other ways on how, uh, de depending on how the forcing is taking place, are not um, closing, or, or well, are have imbalances that again are. And physical, and to the extent that we would like to understand, um, use these reanalysis product, for example, for sea level, right? So we want to do sea level analysis and budgets. We'd like to uh, diagnose the, the uh, thermosteric changes, so the changes in sea level due to heating of the ocean water column over the last few decades. We want to know the component of the barostatic changes, meaning the, the freshwater input from, um, from, uh, for example, especially from the land component. Um, this is not shown in this slide, but again, we know the global mean sea level is on the order of three millimeters per year uh, annual mean. Uh, but then we're looking at the reanalysis products, we go somewhere in the order of, let's say, 20 centimeters per year in balance. So again, we really have problems in how we use these products in this example for, um, for sea level analysis in, 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 in these ocean reanalysis. And, Going more, more now, so these are global mean uh, properties. So uh, now another example, we go into detailed uh, local processes and, and ocean dynamics. So next slide, please. Or maybe, can I actually, maybe I can control this or let me see if I can. If I can. Uh, oh yeah, actually, I can, sorry, I can control it. Um, so this is from a very recent paper. It's actually, I think, still in review uh, by Bailey et al. in 2022. And um, what she's interested in, uh, see if this works, in um, water mass transformation. So how does the ocean get filled, right? So we have oceanographers, we like to uh, label and name different types of water masses that correspond to different density classes. For example, North Atlantic deep water here, Atlantic, uh, uh, Antarctic intermediate water uh, here in this era. But so the study here is interested in uh, Antarctic bottom water formation. So some of the heaviest water masses that we have in the world ocean and specifically the, the transformation of water masses uh, that are produced in the Weddell Sea. And um, so there's a framework for doing this called, uh, uh, it's basically goes back to Valen et al. Uh, um, eight, 1982. And so this transformation property, so we are looking at the volume of certain water masses so that they're bounded by two um, <clears throat> um, basically uh, characteristics. It could be either isotherms or, or, um, um, uh, um, or density isosurfaces, depending on how you do the, the water mass transformation. And you want to know, so this volume, how does this volume of water change, right? So in time, and the, you have the two main contributions are either um, there would be, it would be um, adiabatic changes in the boundaries, so inflow and outflow of certain water masses, and I'm simplifying here a little bit, or whoops, or the or the, the diabatic that means thermodynamic transformation that comes mainly through the surface, for example through air sea heat fluxes, cooling waters that become denser and therefore then um, yeah um, um, basically change their characteristic, and then outflow um, here at the bottom. And so what the study did, it actually used so different reanalysis products, one that has really truly uh, closed budgets in the sense that there is no analysis increments that will that is unphysical in your tracer conservation equation. And that basically partitions this global that's here in black, so the, the change in the animal's water masses here in black, and then uh, partitions this into the the adiabatic component here in red, and then the um, and the, the thermodynamic component in, um, in in green here, and this this can be sort of further uh, um, um, uh, uh, <clears throat> analyzed and in, in more partitioned in more detail. But in, in a reanalysis product that actually does not basically have close property budget that does suffer from. Um, from basically unphysical reanalysis increments has a number that unfortunately you can't actually see here. So here we are on the order of plus minus uh, four sweatrops in, in units that are realistic units and that are, we believe, sort of credible changes 
in, in, um, in water mass transformation, we hear the bottom plot here for this product here has units of plus minus 80 degrees, uh, sorry, 80 uh, swear drop, which is clearly unphysical and unrealistic. And so it's very hard, you know, to use this product for this type of an analysis and trying to understand how basically we, we are basically on an interannual. So this is the time scale here, 1996 to 2014. How, how on an interannual um, timescale, basically these water masses are being produced and, and what variability actually occurs on, on these timescales. This is of course, one of the main reasons why we want to study these or because we want to understand this better. A related example here is in the subtropical North Atlantic. Uh, we have a water mass that's what we call the 18 degree water in the subtropical North Atlantic. And that is related to here in the schematic here from uh, uh, Speer and Forger 19, uh, 2013. So through an annual cycle, we have in during winter months, we have very strong cooling of the water column. And so therefore we have sort of a mixed layer that uh, goes well up almost to the surface, uh, has this uh, on the order of 18 degrees water masses that then the water column restratifies over the summer cycle. And then those, those deep waters basically reside here at the subsurface. And so this study here um, by Evans et al 2017 actually was looking at sort of the season again from 2004 to 2012, looking at the, again, the anomalous um, vo uh, volume of this temperature classes of water. So basically what's shown here is temperature as a function of time and the color basically represent uh, water volumes. And you really see very nicely the seasonal cycle in, um, in how, um, basically mud water is being formed, basically resides here at the 18 degree level. Um, it basically goes from year to year, restratification, and then re reproducing these, these water mass transformation. And then suddenly you see here in the, in the years 2011, 10, 2010, 2011, you see suddenly this blue anomaly. So it's basically um, a, a negative anomaly compared to the one of the previous year. And of course, as we are very interested in trying to understand what causes those anomaly. Is this animal is heating from the surface? So is this due to the fact that we have very strong anomalies in the, the surface heating or cooling? Uh, or is this due to changes in, in advection? So these the one is adiabatic, it might be wind induced changes, the other one really would be more buoyancy force. So this is from this is uh, derived from um, an Argo atlas. So it, it's it's purely it's using only data. This, the, the right one uses an, an ocean state estimate. And then, so this is the, the cautionary tale about just the use of the data, right? So there's this idea, Argo is an unprecedented sampling of the water column. We don't need any of the reanalysis product anymore because Argo really provides us with a very good sampling. And that of course falls apart once we take derivatives, right? So we here we have anomalous uh, volumes. And now we look, we take the time derivative of those anomalies. And we see that for the Argo data per se, there's, there's so much noise in the system because it's, um, um, it, it probably reflects mesoscale activity that's seen by the Argo data that you cannot actually uh, do any analysis of the, of the time evolution of these volume anomalies, which you, you can do in the reanalysis product. Uh, so in, in this case, the, the echo product, where you can actually really diagnose and actually look at um, uh, well, actually, you know, so isolate, sorry, so I, I isolate these changes here and you can actually then relate these changes. So the implied, um, so that's the bottom panel here, the implied um, uh, transformation that's due to the air sea fluxes can be diagnosed from the, um, from the atmospheric reanalysis product that's forced here and where you can see the correspondence um, on the right here between the ocean product and the, and the corresponding atmospheric uh, product. Uh, so the, whoops, okay. So the, the next example is diagnosing and trying to use reanalysis products for understanding the, um, the, the temporary surface uh, global warming slowdown that we had at the, at the first uh, decade of the, of the 20th, 21st century, the so-called uh, hiatus. Uh, and then the question is what, what was happening in the hiatus and what we know, what, what we, we see from ocean observations that we have shown here um, as a function of depth 
um, the changes in temperature, trends in temperature between the 1990s here, that's the first panel A, and then the 2000, that's panel B, where we see that the, the, the positive trends in at near the surface um, have been muted as we go into the 21st century. So smaller trends in the 21st century near the surface, but compensated by subsurface strong heat uptake in the water column at the level of around, let's say, 300 to 500 um, meter depth. So the sort of uh, apparent surface slowdown in the warming actually compensated um, by actually subsurface warming in the water column. Two minutes. Sorry? Four minutes. Two. Yeah, so the, the right here shows the use of uh, several uh, ocean reanalysis products, which show, um, which basically attempting to do the, the same type of calculation, looking at the trend differences between the 1990s and the 2000s, which is basically the, the panel F here, and showing really unrealistically large changes in the water column down to, um, you know, be, beyond, below 1,000 meter depth that purportedly have, you know, strong vertical heat you know, sequestration in the ocean, but that are clearly unphysical if we compare this to the available um, observations that we have. And so, um, and then that brings me to my last example. Uh, that works. So now it doesn't work now that I try to, okay, so one more. Okay, so the last example here is from a much more um, sort of short-term um, um, a data assimilation product that's done out of the Australian group, where they're looking at the impact of data assimilation of unassimilated quantities, right? So, and they basically, the highlight here is, so we've seen this picture a lot, you know, the impact of the analysis increment, but their highlight is here that not only do you have this analysis increment basically giving you a new state, but then the impact of that state having to basically readjust, right? So there are, you know, in the ocean, we call these barotropic and baroclinic readjustment processes that happen because we are basically pulling up a, a new uh, ocean state. And so the, what they are looking at here is from, uh, so these are certain satellite altimeter tracks. There are some uh, eddy uh, sea surface height anomalies that they're analyzing here off the coast of uh, Australia. And actually really looking at, so the, first of all, the, assimilation of some of the observed quantity like sea surface height anomalies, but then what does it do to some of the unobserved variables that potentially be important for other applications, like for example, the upcoming NASA SWAT satellite mission, where vertical velocities are important or applications to biogeochemical uh, models. And so the, the panel here is in days. So these are always assimilation times. We see the, the red spot here. Surface panel is eddy kinetic energy, which is, looks Quite right because it basically has a very strong and direct uh, connection to the assimilation of sea surface height anomalies. But then the bottom panel shows the diagnosed vertical velocity component in the ocean, where you see these uh, basically persistent, you know, intermittent spikes in the vertical velocity at the time of analysis, uh, which are again clearly unphysical, and where they basically show well we have to. If we wanted to use those uh, vertical velocity fields for other types of applications, we need to basically let the ocean readjust for, ne for at least a day or so before we can, we basically, we fall back to somewhat realistically, basically in the envelope of the, um, of the, uh, of the calculations. And so that brings me to the summary, basically just um, what I've basically trying to provoke the community a little bit by saying, you know, we in the ocean climate community want to use these products for getting gaining mechanistic understanding and, and climate diagnostics. Um, and um, really the failure of dynamical and kinematic consistency really brings about you know, serious problems in trying to use um, some of these products. And with that, I'm happy to take questions at this time. Patrick, uh, very nice overview. Thank you. That last example you showed, isn't that just a model bias that you would need to take care of? And your time scale is too short. There's no memory in that vertical velocity component. So that you're just pulling up the vertical mm -hmm. velocity yep, and then yep. it falls right back down to where it that, right. wants it to be. Yes. It's a, well, it's an initialization problem, but any, well, I think the point of this paper, which is not, I'm not at all involved in you, and you know, Peter Oker, he's the second author on that paper. It is basically just saying the, uh, can I go back? This, 
in, in when we consider the, I mean, any analysis increment is in, at least in the ocean, um, unless you have really good balance operators, but is, is an, an, an a reinitialization problem, which basically brings about initialization shock, which basically has impacts on some of the variables that they are analyzing, like the vertical velocity. And it, it's very sensitive, the vertical velocity in the ocean, it's often diagnosed from the horizontal velocity. So it, it becomes especially important for any bar, barotropic uh, adjustment processes. And, but yeah, I mean, it's, you can look at it that way, but it's, it's sort of, it should be ubiquitous in sequential data assimilation in one form or another, unless you have really good mitigation strategies like balance background operators. Yeah, so, yeah. And I don't know what their system is doing in that respect. You probably, yeah. Yeah, I'm really just trying to get my daily steps in today. Your what? Daily steps. So, Patrick, uh, thanks for the presentation. And I think you're underscoring, in some respects, the fact that the data simulation problem is a, a multi scale problem. And so, that you've chosen the typical analysis has chosen a time scale. And that time scale works for processes that, that reside within the, 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 the samplings. Whereas for the longer time scale processes, it doesn't do well, such as closing budgets. I'm wondering, has there been any research whereby, if you have control of the underlying model, could you use the deviations, say, from your short time scale increments, calculate averaged quantities across those, and then reinitialize that parent model so that it's now integrating over a longer window in some kind of regression type approach, such that you then close those budgets? But you're using information from the short time scale fluctuations from the data mm -hmm. without having to re. So it's kind of like a poor man's assimilation at a longer time scale as a way of bridging from short to long. Yeah. Well, I, I'm, I have not done this type of research, but I, I would think that the, the reconstraint for DVAR that's been presented this morning is in some sense getting a little bit at that, right? Because you are, um, you are allowing basically, if de facto you're allowing a source term in your equations of motion, right? So, and that's the, that's why, why it's only weakly constrained and the source term will capture maybe some of what you are describing. And maybe, maybe I'm misrepresenting this and, and Patrick is, uh, should jump in here, but that's exactly, well, it's, or it's basically along the lines that you are suggesting. And I mean, they are, I think other people are really looking at, you know, can another way of formulating is how can the analysis increments that you are Getting be fed back into the into the data astronation system to mitigate some of the the problems. Um, but again, I I I may rep misrepresent the the type of work that's going on. But I think, especially the what Patrick uh, described this morning is really moving in in that direction. Yeah, I think that at least that would be mm -hmm. a way of. I mean, obviously, this is yeah. a little bit of a negative story, but I think there's some pathways to to make it a yeah. solution in that direction. Okay. All right. Thank you, Patrick. Our next speaker will be uh, Jeff Whitaker, and he will talk about characterization of uncertainty, uh, which has been ever important. But as we start to couple more components, will become even more important. Thanks, Ron. So. Um, we became interested in this topic uh, in the context of, of 20 CR because, you know, we're talking about a century scale long reanalysis where there's huge changes in the observing system. So we, you know, it became obvious that if we didn't have a, a way to estimate the, you know, the changes on uncertainty, um, then it would be really hard for the users of the data set to determine what, you know, indices of what, whether the indices of climate variability that they want to diagnose are, are um, significant or not. So this, this talk will be presenting um, the work of, of my collaborators at PSL, Laura, Gil, Prashant, and, and Sei Chun, in our efforts to improve the estimates of, of uh, uncertainty in 20CR. 
And this, this graphic here uh, in the background is an image produced by Philip Brohan uh, at the UK Met Office, and, or Hadley Center, sorry. And it's illustrating, it's a, it's a visualization of the uncertainty in 20CR where this, those uh, gray shaded areas he calls the, the fog of ignorance. And it represents the, air, the, the regions where the estimated uncertainty is as large as the climatological variability. And then the colors that are shining through are, and the dots indicate uh, the, the observations and the colors that are shining through are indicating the, the temperature and precip fields. So if you go to his Vimeo page, he's got some fascinating animations that show you how the uncertainty um, has evolved, evolved over the century or two centuries of the, the 20th century reanalysis. So, uh, I'm going to talk mostly about random uncertainties, but also about how to estimate systematic biases. So, random uncertainties are, um, you know, represent the interplay between chaotic dynamical error growth and uncertainties in the, you know, the, the, the analysis system itself, for example, observation errors representation error and other suboptimal components of the data simulation system, but they don't include the systematic, you know, slowly varying component of the bias. And you, you really need an ensemble based data simulation to estimate this, this portion of the uncertainty. Uh, typically, the ensemble spread uh, or the variance of the analysis ensemble is used to represent this. But it turns out one of the take home messages is that um, the estimates are very uh, sensitive to some of the parameters of, of the ensemble data simulation itself, particularly the inflation and localization. And those parameters themselves are sensitive to the observing, you know, the optimal values of those parameters are sensitive to the observing system. So you need, this only really works if you have a well-tuned system where those parameters adapt to changes in the observing network. And the systematic component, which I'll talk about uh, briefly at, at, at the end, because uh, Patrick uh, has already talked a lot about this. Um, typically, analysis increments are used uh, to estimate the systematic error component, but this only works where, uh, in those cases where it, you have observations that are available to correct the, the systematic component of the model forecast bias. So, first of all, for the random component, um, in, in the first version of the 20th century uh, reanalysis, we used a very simple, we were somewhat naive, and used a very simple multiplicative, constant multiplicative inflation to represent some of the missing or underrepresented sources of, of random error in the ensemble DA system. So we had a, a single constant over the northern hemisphere, another constant over the tropics, and another constant for the northern hemisphere that was simply applied to the ensemble perturbations at every assimilation step to, to increase the variance to make up for those sources of uncertainty that we weren't representing. And we change that constant discontinuously across the assimilation period to, to reflect changes in the observing system. Because when you have more observations, um, it turns out you need to inflate more. Because obviously, if you have no observations, um, then your, you, your ensemble is representing climatological variants of the model. And if you inflate that, it's going to cause the whole simulation system to blow up. So we use these preset uh, values, and as a consequence, we had some pretty strange looking uh, behavior in our estimated uncertainty. So this is a plot showing uh, a global uh, temperature anomaly, tropospheric temperature anomaly derived from the 20th century reanalysis. The, the solid curve is the ensemble mean, and the shading is the uncertainty estimated from the analysis spread of that quantity. And you can see some obvious discontinuities 
that are associated with the changes in the in the parameters that that we used at certain you know to reflect certain epochs of the observing system so that that obviously limits the ability of users to use these uh, data sets to to look at a variability of quantities like this because the er the error bars are just not useful and it becomes difficult to to uh, to play, play, place any bounds on, on what's a, a real signal and what's just um, noise. So um, we started looking at methods for 20CR uh, version three, we started looking at methods that would adapt for inflation that would adapt to changes in the observing network. Um, you know, Jeff Anderson and his colleagues here at NCAR have developed Bayesian methods that you can use to estimate the inflation parameters part of the data simulation and that's that's actually available in the dart uh, system um, we were concerned that applying that to this problem would run into issues because we just we, we probably don't have enough observations in the early part of the record to to uh, accurately constrain the inflation parameter so we decided to try a much simpler method um, which we called relaxation to prior spread. It still has a, a, a single parameter, but that parameter basically relaxes the analysis uh, spread back to the spread of the prior. So that's the parameter alpha in that equation on the left. So if alpha is one, then um, the prior, uh, the posterior spread, the analysis spread is, is, is exactly the same as the prior spread or the first guess spread and if that parameter is zero then you're not doing anything but the nice thing about this is if you formulate it in terms of a multiplicative inflation so you just do some algebra you get to the equation on the right um, that multiplicative inflation factor depends upon the difference between the background spread and the analysis spread so when no observations are being assimilated, you're not reducing the spread in your ensemble at all, and you won't inflate the ensemble, regardless of what the parameter alpha is that you specify. So in that sense, it adapts to the observing network, and even with a constant alpha, you're going to get more inflation when the observations are, are more strongly constraining the system, and, and no inflation when the observations aren't doing anything. So for 20 CR V3, after some experimentation, we decided to set the value of alpha to a constant value everywhere of 0.9. And just to give you an idea of the changes in the observing network we're, we're trying to deal with here, the, these are maps from, from Laura's paper of the observing network. Uh, varying from 1854 to 2000. So orders of magnitude more observations. And this is how that um, relaxation to prior spread inflation adapts with those that changing observing network. So um, the, the, the lighter colors here are actually more inflation and the darker colors are, are less or no inflation. So you can see in the early part of the record, the very sparse observing network, there's much less inflation uh, than in the later part of the record. And in general, the, you know, in areas where the observations are denser, you have more inflation. Five minutes. Um, how do you tell whether that's a realistic uh, estimate of uncertainty? Well, one way is to use innovation statistics so to utilize the fact that um, if your background uh, and uh, your background errors and your observation errors are uncorrelated and your system is optimal, then the expected value of the, uh, the innovation, that is the RMS difference between the background ensemble mean forecast and the observation should be the same. The expected value of that is, is the square root of the ensemble spread plus the observation error variance. So this plot shows for the whole record of 20 CRV uh, V3, the black curve is the actual 
innovation, uh, RMS difference between the ensemble mean forecast, background forecast, and the observation. And the dotted curve is the value we predict from the ensemble spread plus the observation error variance. And you see they match pretty well. Correlation is actually 0.97. And the, you know, as expected, both the innovation uh, and the ensemble spread decrease as the number of observations that's represented in the blue curve increase. And revisiting that time series that I showed at the beginning, uh, the blue the blue one is is for 20 CR V2 and the red one is for 20 CR V3. We've eliminated those those spurious jumps in the uncertainty estimate. So it seems like to a first approximation, uh, th this very simple algorithm does a pretty good job in in adapting uh, and producing a more consistent estimate of the analysis uh, uncertainty, at least the random component, uh, you know, as the observing network changes. Um, this is, I, I think in the interest of time, maybe I'll skip this one. This is another, just showing another way of validating the analysis uncertainty using independent, uncertainty estimate using independent upper air observations. But it basically shows the same thing that, you know, the 20 CRV3 estimate is is a vast improvement over the 20 CRV2 estimate, but but in fact, um, in the later part of the record, it appears that we're a bit too underconfident. In other words, the spread is probably a bit too large in in the modern uh, in the modern era with dense observation network, and that could be because of that you know misspecification of that constant value of 0.9 being suboptimal, or it could be because um, we've actually overestimated the observation errors that we've used in the modern part of the record. So just in the time remaining, I'd like to go back to the issue of, of uh, estimating uh, systematic bias using analysis increments. So as I mentioned at the beginning, the, the, the random part of the error that's reflected in the ensemble spread doesn't tell you anything about the systematic slowly varying component that's, that's reflected in those innovations as a persistent offset between the forecast and the observations. Um, you know, Patrick uh, and Bill showed some, estim some, some examples of this from ERA5 in the stratosphere where um, you know, there's an interplay between this this sort of bias and the and, and changes in the observing network that can introduce spurious trends in some quantities, uh, estimated quantities, um, that make the data sets less useful for studying climate variability. And this is another example from a paper in 2012, Zhang et al. I think Arun was a co-author on this paper from CFSR. And the, the left-hand plot is showing the difference in total precipitable water from CF, the CFSR uh, analysis between adjacent decades, uh, showing that the later decade is much moister than the previous decade. And the right-hand plot is a time series of an, uh, total precipitable water increments, showing that there's a jump in the amplitude of the increments um, the global mean uh, amplitude of the increments uh, when when NOAA 15, the AMSU instrument, is launched. And we all of a sudden have a lot more information uh, in the assimilation system that's telling us something about the total precipitable water in the tropics. So basically the model is too moist and we have, we have observations to correct for that bias in the later half of the record, which results in an apparent uh, jump in the time series. So how do we deal with that? Well, um, following the, the approach that was outlined by, in the 2020 paper that Patrick was a co-author on, we decided to look at, um, this is work by Se Chun Chen at PSL, to tr we, and he's wor looked at uh, training a column-based neural network uh, approach to correct 
to, to use analysis increments to come up with an, an, uh, a model error correction that can be applied in line in the model so that if you train it on the, the dense period, the dense of, uh, well observed period where there are enough observations to actually correct for that model bias, and the model bias is actually reflected thereby reflected in the analysis increments, then maybe we can apply that correction to the sparser input period to remove some of those uh, spurious trends in the reanalysis. And these are just a couple of plots from his paper, which is in preparation. Uh, at the bottom shows uh, the, the um, vertical profiles with latitude of the, of the mean correction that's produced by the, the algorithm. Uh, you can see it's correcting, especially for uh, a large uh, moisture bias in the lower, uh, lower troposphere in the tropics and some biases in temperature and winds in the stratosphere. And then the plot on the right is showing if you actually apply that correction in line in the model forecast, you can you can actually reduce significantly the forecast errors out to 10 days. Um, the contours in that plot are percent improvement. So you're talking about a few percent up to maybe 10% reduction in RMS errors, uh, particularly in the stratosphere at, at longer leads. So I think this is a promising approach that we'd like to investigate further for estimating um, the systematic component of the uncertainty. So returning to one of the workshop fundamental questions, what are the critical requirements for a consistent representation, representation of uncertainty? Um, for the random component, I think it's fair to say we need an ensemble data simulation and the parameters of the data simulation system have to be well tuned and adapt to changes in the observing network. Uh, and for the to avoid those spurious uh, jumps and trends in time series that result from the interplay between model bias and changes in the observing network, we need a method for estimating uh, and correcting for that model bias using analysis increments in the dense uh, observation period uh, when we have observations that can correct for that model bias. And then hopefully we can then apply those uh, corrections to reduce the, the the whole idea here is to reduce the error, the systematic component of the error in the background forecast uh, using information and analysis increments. But that presumes we actually have observations that can correct for that model bias, at least in some part of the observational record. So I think I'll stop there. I'm going to ask Jenny if we have time for questions. Time for one question, maybe? Time for one question. Um, how about, oh, okay. Uh, I think I saw this hand first, please. Hi, thanks for a really nice talk. Um, I had a question about um, structural um, errors or that might arise from um, errors in the correlation structure of your prior covariances that maybe would not be affected by um, the inflation, could be affected by localization. But, you know, in, the, in cases where you don't have observations to correct that in the cycling DA framework, could that be another, you know, source of uncertainty is these sort of built-in correlation structures you get in your model? Yeah, I think there's a lot of parameters in the data simulation system and it, you know, and in the model itself, when you have stochastic physics that can contribute to, you know, uh, that, that can contribute to errors in your uncertainty estimate. But I think probably the, the biggest one is inflation. That's what we found is the most, you know, has the most sensitivity, at least to changes in the observing network. But localization too. I mean, when you have very dense observations, then you're going to have you know, the optimal localization link scale is going to be much different than if you have very sparse observations. So that could result in some spurious um, trends in the uncertainty estimate as well. All right, so I see Mark Rodwell has his hand raised, but let's save that for the discussion, we'll move on. I stopped.
Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. Very nice. Yeah, we'll come back, Isla, as well. We'll come back in the discussion section. So our last talk of the session is from Anka Brangshaw uh, from ECMWF. I guess we could have let you go first this session and let you get to bed a little earlier. Um, she'll be speaking about the regional uh, net reanalysis experience. Um, yeah, okay, you're ready to go, great. Thank you, and apologies for jumping the gun and putting my screen up. I took Jenny's invitation, um, uh, Jenny's prompting as an invitation. Um, thank you for inviting me to present the um, experience that the Copernicus Climate Change Service has had in the last four or five years with regional reanalysis. Uh, I say I'm speaking about it because I am primarily the messenger. It is my colleague Sandra Sharani, Hans Hersbach, and Conrad Soch who look after this work primarily. Um, and I must uh, confess from the beginning that I intend to deviate a bit from the title, which is one that was specified in the program. I'm going to be talking not so much about the Copernicus perspective as the Copernicus experience, because in Europe there are activities on regional reanalysis which go beyond the Copernicus Climate Change Service. Um, there are activities which uh, uh, try to do regional reanalysis or did regional reanalysis for Europe as a whole. I believe they take place at Deutsche Wetterdienst in Germany, um, but also uh, smaller regions, national level uh, reanalysis in Ireland and as far as I know in Italy as well. Um, the Copernicus uh, Climate Change Service started about four years ago, five years ago, uh, with uh, putting together some uh, effort to create uh, high resolution data for Europe. And I'm going to tell you about how it happened and what lessons we learned and the contractors who work on this learned as well. So the teams that did the work came from Met Norway, uh, Danish Met Institute, Swedish Met Institute and Meta France. I'm struggling to navigate. Okay, so why regional reanalysis in the climate change service? Well, uh, a variety of reasons. Firstly, uh, there were uh, additional observations uh, available, um, local source observations, slightly different um, treatment of satellite data um, available, which were thought to be um, worth putting into play. Uh, of course, high resolution models would give better description of surface characteristics, in particular in the regions covered by ice and snow. But of course, also the orography and soil information would be um, uh, leads to a more, more, more realistic representation if available at such high resolutions. In the uh, activities we put together, uh, I'm giving away the fact that we did work on two different regions. We had models at five and a half kilometers for Europe as a whole and uh, two and a half kilometers for the Arctic region. Uh, by comparison to year five, which is 31 kilometers. So clearly it was appealing to users to, to, to jump so much from uh, the global reanalysis to a local scale. Um, <clears throat> of course, these models have been created and the models that were used for numerical weather prediction in these regions, and they were uh, tuned and adapted to represent the uh, features over the local orography uh, better. These are the two domains for which we created reanalysis, um, as you can see uh, in the topography and ocean uh, land sea mask uh, are clearly represented here. On the right hand side, the two regions uh, describe the two uh, areas over the Arctic that the work took place. And I'm going to start with the, with the example of the Arctic. So the name of this particular product is CARA. Uh, you would find it published already. Um, and uh, here I'm putting the link to the, uh, to the place where you can find it. Um, the work started with two subdomains, the two uh, institutes involved, uh, Met Norway and the DMI, uh, had models that they were operating over the regions, over individual regions uh, in their case, um, and they wanted to, to deploy them as they were as quickly as possible. So the models come from the Armoni Aladin family. Uh, at two and a half kilometer resolution, they used a non hydrostatic version. They used the R5 lateral boundary conditions and the physiographic data sets appropriate for this resolution, as well as assimilating additional uh, local observations. A paper describing the methodology is in preparation, um, not ready yet, but details on the methodology and the systems used uh, can be found in a documentation uh, published in our climate data store, where the data is also 
fund for what else for download. Um, it was published, the data was published about last year, I think. Uh, it covers the period September 1990 to June 2021. It resides in several catalog entries because there's a large variety of data that's on offer. So the single level, including soil data, data on pressure levels, on height levels, on model levels. Um, so there is opportunity to explore the data um, in, in full, really. Um, the availability, the data is available at hourly resolution. Every three hours, there is a, a, a point of analysis uh, and the forecast that fill the gaps are at hourly resolution. So you can see, not surprisingly, that the representation um, is, is more realistic looking in this particular case. It's not a, an actual evaluation, but um, clearly a Lancy mask and the, the Lancy contrasts appear to be sharper at the very for the European domain as a whole, um, the effort uh, continued um, regional reanalysis that were created in research mode uh, previously. We call this project, this, this product SERA. It consists of three data sets that span the period 1984 to 2021. Um, we do have uh, the atmospheric reanalysis at five and a half the horizontal. Uh, kilometers of horizontal resolution with analysis every three hours and forecast every hour. Again, the data is at hourly resolution, um, prepared uh, hourly resolution. Um, uh, the EDA is also available. So using free forcing from the EDA members of year five, um, 10 members um, in the ensemble, and as well as the land component. So downscaling of the survey analysis of the land um, published separately. This data is not yet made public, but it's due to be published in the next few months. In terms of the system setup, uh, again, it was an, a model from the uh, Aronia Ladan family uh, using the Mass Council of X land uh, model, uh, land system. Uh, boundary conditions were from Mira 5. Local observations, additional local observations in Greenland and Finland were assimilated, as well as 24 hour total precipitation. At the time, uh, UERA Harmony, who you're probably familiar with a uh, previous generation regional reanalysis for Europe, produced in, uh, started in the European project FP7 uh, many years ago, was continued for as long as ERA interim, which was the forcing uh, was available, um, or continued to be updated, uh, and the data has been published, uh, was published, and has been available uh, in the climate data store. It is 11 kilometer horizontal resolution um, five and a half kilometers for the land product and covers the period 1961 to 2090. Now, I want a small aside about evaluation. So this is some um, examples and, and, and information on evaluation that we received from the contractors who worked on the European region, um, primarily, I think, yes, um, Sarah. So, um, Case studies is the obvious way in which people try to demonstrate added value. In this particular case, we can see a comparison between ERA 5 and SERA, uh, looking at 10 meter wind speed at a particular event, a storm event. Um, so um, the features of, of note are the um, wind over the lakes, which uh, are at these two locations. I hope you can see my, my prompt. Um, clearly, there's a distinction between the wind over the lakes and the surrounding area, which doesn't appear in ERA 5, of course, um, and uh, also um, more realistic wind speeds um, are present over the uh, land uh, region that is uh, the island in the picture. Um, at one of the stations in the region, uh, in, this, in this circle, um, when we looked over the period that the storm passed through, uh, you can see that the observations in red are closer to the SARA product than to the ERA 5 product. So this is again one case study over one event at one location. More generally, over longer periods of time, this goes between uh, 1984 and 1986, so for two years. Uh, this is an event, this is a, a, a representation of snow depth in an alpine region. Uh, Comparing products from the land components, so uh, as I said, Sarah land, you know, five land, uh, and comparing them with some um, truth 
which is given by the saffron data set. It's in black in these pictures, so you can see the green era five uh, is further away from from the uh, from this truth than the uh, higher resolution regional reanalysis, both the UERA and the SERA uh, versions of it. But these are, I would argue, uh, relatively unconvincing, maybe. Uh, uh, examples because they really just look at small um, periods of time or small areas. Um, what do we plan to do for Copernicus II? Um, uh, we have already started or almost ready to start on the near real time updates for the current versions of the European and Arctic reanalysis, the CARA and SERA. Uh, we will publish the data two or three months behind real time. We're also preparing a next generation pan-Arctic regional reanalysis. The domain uh, will cover the whole region. Um, work is needed to set this up, um, but it is hoped that very soon we will start to work on a reanalysis covering the period 1991 to 2025, at least. Um, for Europe, we are not currently planning to develop a new version of reanalysis, but we want to support activities at national scale to downscale uh, the current regional or indeed global reanalysis and try to um, extend the period back in time, the period that is currently covered by Sarah. What did C3S learn in this context? Uh, we thought a lot about evaluation because as funders or producers, if you will, we needed to prioritize resources uh, and effort. Um, so evaluation is important for producers. It is also important for users, as we've heard several times this week, um, because they need to select from a number of products or indeed fully to accept reanalysis or observations, for example, in the case of verification of climate predictions. Evaluation exists already uh, by providers. It's very important because they know the methodology and they know the angles from which the evaluation can be uh, systematically done. And, and there's an example here on a paper that describes uh, some features of evaluation from CARA. <coughs> it's a very recent paper. Um, there is some evaluation for use by users as well, and I think Chiara Cagnazzo showed us yesterday some examples. But I would like to put up the question of whether the methodology currently used in the reanalysis community is sufficient for such objectives, in particular for the objective of helping users make choices. What did the producers learn in this context? And here I'm virtually rendering the conclusions that were written in a lessons learned document by the contractors themselves, because this is probably relevant for people who would run the analysis themselves. So on system development, this is the way in which they structured their feedback on, on system development, testing and implementation. They concluded that some of the improvements um, were due to the use of new data. They tried to deviate from the NWP model configurations. As I said, they were using versions of the model that had been used in NWP for a while, and they, they, they valued very much the use in operations prior to uh, the deployment for reanalysis because they found that the testing that comes with use in operations was invaluable, but any modifications they had to make uh, took time and were costly uh, in HPC as well as human cost. Uh, and this is why here they used these sparingly. Uh, they were thinking they need to make modifications on the quality control setup because of the very high resolution, uh, the possibility of rejecting genuine observations of extreme events uh, increases. Um, and of course, they they uh, found that the HPC resources required were, uh, were slightly underestimated to start. For the preparation of input data sets, of course, you're probably familiar with it um, more than I am. Um, it wasn't trivial. Um, but they found that this data can have uses be beyond the, their production of reanalysis, so they're thinking of sharing this data more widely. Also, they um, had their mind on the need to plan for the real-time component um, and to try to think about how to use data uh, for which collection in near real-time or in real-time uh, is important. Finally, on production, they concluded that the HPC uh, requirements in production mode are, non are, are significant not least because um, there are risks of bottlenecks. They run things in parallel streams. Um, the, the, the logistics of, of running the code and deploying the code and, and handling the data, or even on the ECMWF HPC where these, focus, these products are run, were, were a problem at times. Um, and they also decided that the monitoring tools they used could be improved. But all in all, the conclusion was that the evolution of the system for use in reanalysis was a good thing because it would also benefit their uh, NWP suites. 
So I'm going to leave you with these three key messages. My take on it is that the use case rests primarily on the high spatial resolution, but the costs are significant. So I would argue that the valuation is key. Thank you. Thank you, Anka, for a very nice um, summary of those results. Um, other questions? Sorry? Jen, please yell out. Hi, Anka, this is Sergey. Uh, thank you for your uh, nice summary of European efforts. Well, how, in your uh, experience how much uh, extra benefit you get to uh, by simulating observations locally versus just um, you know running a downscaled version forced by boundary conditions so i think this is what i was trying to to uh, argue that the evidence i've seen doesn't give a conclusive answer to this it, it's primarily based on case studies so maybe hans who was closely involved with this knows better than i do if there is anything convincing but but we we think that more in that evaluation to draw some meaningful conclusions about this would be necessary. I don't know if Hans wants to add anything. If you have the resolution of the model, you can assimilate the local observations, and that's always better than uh, having some st stochastical downscaling that is based on some model output statistics or neural network or, or whatever. That's what I would say. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know the answer, but I, I think it's. Uh, it's likely that that is better to, to, to just assimilate the observations where you can, and when you have the resolution. Thank you, Hans. I guess a follow-up question. Um, in like at Norway in operations, the cost of running the regional system with um, um, very frequent assimilation is the same or exceeds the cost of running a global system. So in terms of um, your original reanalysis, is it more expensive than ERA-5, similar expense? Can you comment on that? Again, I have to defer, maybe Carlo knows better the answer to this. I mean, it wasn't a straightforward uh, comparison because we did develop the, re the global reanalysis in-house and we use contractors to do the regional, but I don't know, Carlo, do you remember um, actual numbers? No, I don't. <laughs> I don't remember the. Um, maybe Hans does. Um, my wow. feeling is that it's less expensive than than Euro five, quite a bit. Um, nevertheless, I, I guess the question is 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 really the right question, because um, is at the end of the day is a value for money <laughs> or uh, exercise. So how much benefit do you extract from this high resolution, with respect to what you extract from a global um, global maybe high resolution global reanalysis. And I guess the jury in many respects is still out. And I really like what Anka said in her presentation about the value of evaluation there, because um, we don't yet have the full, the full answer, I think. And if you haven't guessed, one of the reasons we are not repeating the exercise over Europe as a whole is the fact that we did run out of money to fund this. So whereas we thought that uh, doing the full region over the Arctic, in, in um, including over the pole, would be a good thing to try. Uh, for Europe, we decided that other downscaling techniques would be what we support in the near future. I, I, I'm not sure though that other centers won't be doing some high resolution European reanalysis. I suspect DWD is planning to do something along those lines. I can confirm that uh, the regional analysis is uh, significantly cheaper than uh, the Euro 5. I don't know the numbers, but uh, it's it, 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 it's a factor. I don't know whether it's a factor of five or ten or three or four, but it is it is it is a factor which is pretty much larger than two, and costs cheaper. The period was half the period of year five hundred. So, yeah, but 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 even then, even so, okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Hans. Thank you, Anka. We have other questions. Anything online? Let me uh, ask a question if I could. I might have misunderstood the context, but I think Anka, in one of your last slides, um, you mentioned that the improvements seem to come from observations. Um, I guess I'm thinking of those 
pictures East NWF has produced, you know, where you look at the forecast skill from reanalyses and from the operational system. And, you know, it's always like the model and system development is accounts for the lion's share of the improvement as opposed to the ops. Is that, you know, more just relating to forecasts versus the analysis? Or I was, I guess I was surprised to see that evolution of the models and the DA wasn't significant or did I misconstrue well, the input you meant by no, that? No. Not really. So the short answer is we don't have a similar uh, diagnostic, but what we were trying to show in the Euro 5 plot is the fact that in the same kind of forecast system set up, a new cycle has brought benefits. Whereas here we are comparing of a, for regional reanalysis, we'd be comparing the, the ECMWF Euro 5, the ECMWF system with that of Met Norway, which and or, or DMI, which are quite different. So they didn't do such such uh, um Comparisons, they concluded that the benefit comes from the extra observations um, and the better representation of the land surface. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm just passing on their, their conclusion. As I said, I haven't seen the convincing evidence for that. Yes, Patrick, please. Hi, Anka, this is. This is Patrick. Um, very nice presentation. I was wondering the um, the, the regional pan Arctic um, effort that you're spinning up. Is that an atmosphere only, or does it is that coupled to sea ice, or even atmosphere, sea ice, ocean? There's some very compelling. I mean, it's a, it's regionally it's a very compelling coupled system, right? Because the any biases in, for example, certain parts of the atmosphere, low cloud cover that has an impact on radiation or surface air temperature has an immediate and strong potential impact on sea ice um, and, and snow cover. And the, the same for the, the ice-free regions the, the, that's sort of ocean covered. So is, the, is this um, a, a thought or is that feasible or? I think, so, so probably Hans would give you a better answer. My feeling is that the model, the one to use, it's still an atmosphere only model. But... Yeah, it's, it's uncoupled. And uh, I agree, it would be better to have a coupled system, but the, 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 uh, the developments are not that far yet uh, in the national weather centers to have those coupled models at high resolution. Hi, this is Anne Wynn from UT Austin. I just wanted to make a comment that uh, uh, even though you didn't have a chance to do the evaluation, but uh, we have just uh, become aware of the product and we intend to actually uh, uh, try to use it to see how well, especially with the regional. And it seems that you mentioned there was some validation or the paper showed the validation with the surface data. So hopefully that would be quite more useful for us. So we, if we find out something, we can report back. Please do yes. This is this is our hope that you know community efforts would boost any information we have from our contractors. We we had to the the, the spend was uh, or or the effort uh, took more than they expected, so they didn't have time to do the evaluation in full. But we plan for the next contract to issue to insist on evaluation, ideally upfront because you want to know if it's worth investing or not. So anything that comes back, any publications would be really welcome. Thank you. Any other questions? Anything online? Nothing online. I think we can open this up to the broader discussion. Okay, so in looking at the agenda, it looks like we have an hour for discussion now. Uh, which is- I think that might be a typo. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's funny, everything else follows after it, but um, I, I was wondering about that. But we'll just start the discussion now, if we all agree on that, um, and then, go as long as I guess we need to or are able to. Um, I certainly know there were questions coming back to, for example, Jeff's talk um, and some of the other talks. So does anybody want to? Um... Yes. Just a quick Pilot, clarification. Great. We'll take discussion for another 10 minutes and then we'll have a 20 minute break before resuming and breakouts. Okay, so did you say 10 minutes? 10 minutes for discussion. Okay. Hi, Alice Simpson from NCAR. I had a question for Jeff about your machine learning 
bias correction. And I'm wondering for something like moisture, where you have a clear long-term global warming signal, do you worry about the bias changing in time if you try to apply that far back, or is that kind of a higher order? Jeff, can you hit the mic, please? Yeah, that that's a good point. Um, since you're using analysis increments to train, um, and the analysis increments are using are, are informed by observations, uh, maybe that wouldn't be a problem as long as the you had observations for a long enough period to actually constrain the model bias. But I'd have to think more about that. I guess it's okay if your response to the forcings is represented correctly and you just kind of pin it at that one end yeah. and then hope that when you're back in time with less CO2, yeah. well, it's kind of okay. Yeah. Yes. Well, I have a moment saying. I, I think you're on. Hello, I have a question for, this is Wesley, I'm second from CPC. I have a question for Jeff. You show uncertainty estimates, but I don't have a problem with this because users often filter the data, monthly means. How do I get the uncertainty estimates for that? Yeah, that, that requires that you have an, you know, every ensemble, you calculate that derived quantity for every ensemble member and then compute the variance because those two operations don't commute. You love projections, you know? Yeah. It gets really difficult. It gets difficult. It's possible if you, if you can project every ensemble member in EOF space and then compute the variance, but not many people are doing that. I agree. A question online from Mark Rodwell. Uh, a very similar question to Isla's question, believe it or not, but maybe I could sort of just try to rephrase it. I mean, the idea of learning about the model um, model bias from the more recent period and then applying it to the past, that probably gets us quite, quite a long way in trying to, to remove the remove that aspect. But the holy grail, as Isla was alluding to, is, you know, the model sensitivity to the anthropogenic forcing, the CO2. And we're, the question is: Will we ever get to the point where we can use reanalysis to actually to actually perfect and, and learn about the models um, the models response to the, say the CO two rising? It would mean that we'd want sort of mean increments to be zero throughout the whole um, sort of uh, reanalysis period, kind of thing. I guess uh, you know, in, uh, yeah, yeah, sort of mean in in, in sort of throughout. Th every year, say, or every decade, we'd want the mean increments to be zero. I can give an answer, nobody. Oh. Go ahead. Yeah. So I think uh, if you want to really have a system in which you can see what the response of the reanalysis to CO2, then you definitely have to have a coupling with the ocean, because if you have an atmosphere only, then uh, then the, the the fact that you have an SST uh, that you prescribe that uh, that whatever well not whatever you do, but uh, it will it will uh, the atmosphere will really be strongly forced by by that SST. And therefore, you're not able to see the effect of the CO2 that clearly as if, then if you have a fully coupled system with the ocean, which is unbiased. I guess the question is whether, yeah, whether it's, is it a realistic goal to, to aim for, or is that just, just something that's not worth thinking about? Uh, yeah, I think so. It should be great uh, that we can do that here. Yeah, of course. Cecile, did you have something to add? Um, yeah, I think I'll add to that and um, my connection was um, acting up. So I think I, I understood correctly uh, the comment, but one thing on top of the SST that we do want to include is um, not to beat a dead horse here, but 
ocean biogeochemistry because uh, it of course plays especially in some region of the world a pretty important um feedback onto the carbon sink in the ocean um and the point that you were making uh and i think it was about how we can use the atmospheric reanalysis to um look at the effect of carbon dioxide and, and the future of carbon dioxide, was that correct? It was just a, um, trying to understand whether the model's response to the CO2 increases was correct, you know, whether or whether there was a, a model error in its response to the, the CO2. Obviously, it's a really big <laughs> problem, as Hans has uh, highlighted, but yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I think um, the one thing that I can add to that is also the time, this plays on a time scale um, of, you know, much more than just the 10, 20 years. And that brings another topic, which is um, if you look in terms of the carbon cycle that involves the ocean, um, you are looking at something that you ideally would have a, a hundred years to look at, right? And and we don't have that in terms of ocean color. Um, so we rely on a portion of the model run that would be free run that uses the atmospheric CO2 that we know of, but that doesn't have all the data, if that makes sense. Yep, <laughs> thanks, yeah, thanks. Any, nothing online at the moment? Nothing okay. online. Um, so I guess, Jeff, I might have one or two for you. Um, you showed this one with the, um, I guess it was the, you know, the, um, error estimation technique. You've shown the predicted RMSE and the actual RMSE, a very nice match. Um, that was for the alpha 0.9. Now, I guess it would be difficult to know this without running the whole experiment, but do you have any sense of how sensitive that getting that match is? To, is alpha, you know, a hair trigger or is the kind of thing that? Uh, it, hard to answer. I and mean, we did some experiments where we, we subset the modern period to look like, you know, 1930 and 1900 and ran some short experiments to see how sensitive it was and it's not a hair trigger but it 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 does make a difference and i think um you know you would you would probably like to get rid of that parameter altogether sure um but to a first approximation it does a pretty good job so when you showed then the revised time series of the uncertainty estimate i was actually rather surprised at how constant and tight that was throughout the period. Like the uncertainties weren't quite a bit larger early on, or did I miss that? I know in your first version of that plot, you had that big discontinuity in, in the uncertainty, but you know the values were clearly larger earlier than later. When I looked at the revised version of that, it, you know the uncertainties in 1840 were just a bit bigger than the uncertainties in 1940. And, uh, was that? Yeah, I know. Do you, you have any? Do you feel confident about that? that? We don't have any independent. Yeah, no, it's just I would have nice. thought that was going to be a much more of a sort of looking like a cone. Yeah. I'll, so this is Laura Slavinsky. Uh, I th I would have expected that too. My assumption is that it has to do with it's a it's like the five hundred to one thousand layer temperature anomaly, and I think it has to do with that. That it, it's sort of a a step removed uh, quantity. I think part of it also is that, uh, like Jeff sort of quickly went through in the following slide, um, in the modern time period, I think we're over inflating still. And so you you might not have noticed, but the the blue spread at the in the modern time period was very narrow, and the red was much larger. And I think that large, relatively large red spread <laughs> should have been less, and then you would have had more of a difference, so I think that's part of it. Yeah. Um, yeah, you do see the cone in other variables, so that's that's yeah, yeah. But all that being said, I mean, 
I looked at that and thought, well, you know, thinking now I'm trying to sort of stay true to my comments this morning about thinking about pushing this toward multi-component. I mean, one of the encouraging things about that, I thought to the extent that, you know, we have faith in something like that is, you know, we have, when, if we're thinking about earth system analysis, we're thinking probably about more components where there are more times with less observations. So maybe something like that is potentially promising for, you know, a multi-component analysis, particularly. Particularly, yeah. And I, I think for that specific example, another reason we're probably underestimating the error bars in the early part is that we prescribe the SST, you know, a coupled system with the same algorithm we might have much larger error bars on that quantity. Yeah. Okay, let's take one final question. There's one by Bill Bell online. Go ahead, Bill. Thanks, Jenny. It's uh, directed at Jeff. Thanks for the talk, Jeff. I really enjoyed it. Um, you covered your treatment of uh, random uncertainties and then the approach to biases using machine learning, which is quite analogous to the approach that Patrick described that we're exploring using weak constraint uh, model error forcing. But, but one of the issues that I'd be interested in your thoughts on is um, when you do the best you can to correct those biases, and yet you're still left with a, um, if you like, an error in the mean state. How do you capture? How do you estimate that mean state uncertainty? Uh, is that something that you think is important? I know that Laura mentioned it uh, earlier today as well. Um, it's something that we're thinking about, and I'd be very interested in your thoughts on that that problem. Yeah, I, I think that is important. And, you know, I guess one approach would be to not assimilate everything you have. So you always have some independent observations to give you a sense of what your your mean bias is. Um, but yeah, I mean, especially in the early part of the record where you want to extract, you don't have that much information, you want to use everything you got, then you really have no independent way of assessing what's left. Thanks. Do we have another minute or two or? Oh, uh, we have time. I'm at time right now. Did you have something to say? I, I did. I actually, this is for Patrick. Yeah. So, sorry, I forgot. We have more than one Patrick. Yes. So, maybe this is um, semantics, but I'm, I guess, trying to think about the idea of you know, what the use, you know, one person's ceiling is another person's floor, but I, I, I was intrigued by actually even the title of your talk was, which was the trade-off between accuracy and dynamic balance. Why is it that dynamic balance couldn't itself be some form of accuracy? And maybe that's what, yeah, it sounds like dynamic balance is not necessarily accuracy, but uh, maybe people are looking for that particular in a, a reanalysis application. I actually, I, I didn't choose the title myself, but uh, ah. and I, I forgot to, I forgot to sort of um, relate to to change it. The point, the point I'm trying to make is that um, the in many, and actually Anne made that point a little bit yesterday, right? So you many of the assessments of the reanalysis are in terms of how they fit the observations, right? So how well do they have the, the available observations that we have? Um, the, in climate diagnostics, oftentimes the observations, we fit the observations to within some uncertainty, right? And, and sometimes maybe we don't fit them as well in the uncertainty, but we are, what we want to also do, we want to understand how anomaly signals propagate through the climate system right in this case in the ocean how is is the is the you know the, the deep temperature the subsurface temperature anomalies are they have they been created through you know prior season surface forcing anomalies or have they been generated through um, through transport changes right so this is and the reason why we want to know this is because we want to understand you know where predictability in the ocean comes from on these type of timescales 
And what I'm trying to um, sort of show here is that in many of the reanalysis, these type of analysis are simply not possible because if we look at these, if we basically take apart the uh, conservation equation of tracers, which has, you know, the total DDT, the, the, let's say the tracer DT, the heat uh, change in heat is temper uh, in time is made up of, um, you know, invective processes, diffusive, both, you know, resolved um, diffusion and then parametrized diffusion in, in all components, horizontal, vertical. And so we can really tease apart these budget terms and we can really understand what the how the ocean is you know how how the changes are coming about and these might be these might and in in cases where that tendency equation is properly closed it fulfills the you know the the the, the equations of motions properly we we can actually do it they may be wrong but we can at least get a plausible dynamical assessment of the of the dynamics of what is happening in cases where we have these, where the the uh, the um, uh, the, the um, analysis increments are, are so sizable and of equal magnitude, these type of analysis are just simply no longer possible, right? And so, what I what I did not want to get away with or or leave away is that the mechanisms that have been identified, I showed you know the cases where this is successful, right, in a closed budget mm -hmm. framework. Where you can actually do this, and there is an evidence of, you know, that we know this is uh, adiabatic, you know, wind-driven transport changes as opposed to heating from the surface, for example, is a plausible mechanism that works and within this dynamical framework. Whether it's ultimately the right one, but it, it's one that's that's physically consistent with the dynamics that we know. In the other case, we cannot even do this type of budget analysis. It just prevented because the our tracer equation is basically diluted or contaminated by these very large increments. And so that's, um, that's, that's where I'm saying the, the observational fit of that time evolving trajectory to the observations might not be as good as it was in a filtering methods where you can basically just, you know, have a much better handle on fitting the observations. But all of the unobserved quantities, the tendency terms, vertical velocity terms, um, you know, these these can actually be properly diagnosed in one case, and they they are completely they can be spurious in in the other case. So so that's the that's sort of the where that message comes from. So if that that makes it more clear. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you. Okay, thank you everybody for indulging the extra couple minutes. So 